grandma and dad get to judge the case. <laughs> what time are we supposed to read the main first day? Yes. Oh. Uh, you want to take back over? <laughs> he did a good job. You did a good job. Good job. Well, I did. Yeah. Good singing all night. He did a fun job. I'm looking to learn it. Make sure I see him one. <laughs> oh dear. They listen, the truth is he couldn't tell a thing they all had masks on. Mike was worse. <laughs> His eyes didn't even move. His eyes didn't even move. Okay, are we ready? Online, yes. Right, we'll go ahead and call back to order the reconvened meeting uh, from that was recessed on October 6, 2020. And we're going to take up a couple of items on that agenda now, and then we'll need to recess this meeting again until the end of the work session, and then we'll reconvene it so that we can take up additional items. So uh, let's go ahead and take care of the two items we definitely need to vote on. Um, and one would be under new business item one, the schedule of values for 2021. So I recognize Ms. Ash to follow up with additional comments and then we'll be prepared to take action. Good afternoon. I just want to check, does anybody have any additional <laughs> questions before I ask? For the adoption of the schedule. <laughs> I've seen that. <laughs> I thought we did a good job. Any additional questions, Tabitha? Mickey? Uh, any questions? No, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Okay. All right. Well, do I have a motion then to adopt the schedule of values for 2021? So moved. We have to adopt Second. We have to adopt the market value and the present use value. All right. So that was, oh. is a motion including market yes. value and the present use value. Okay. All right. Making sure that's clear. We have a motion second. and a second. Is there any question or discussion? If not, Madam Clerk. Commissioner Dietz? Yes. Commissioner Woody? Yes. Commissioner Luker? Yes, ma'am. Commissioner Mao? Yes. Chairman Mao? Yes, motion carried. Thank you. Thank you. And then the other item uh, is the legislation item six, the amendment to the Unified Development Ordinance. Uh, this is the erosion control language, Mr. Poston. And, and really quickly, uh, you know, uh, just a reminder, the planning board did hear a couple of people, uh, the whole public hearing on September 10th. They've recommended this unanimously to the board. And uh, there's also a consistency statement uh, that we need to be approved. Any questions? I right, have a motion then to approve this amendment to the Unified Development Ordinance as, and also the consistency statement. So moved, so move, Mr. Chairman. I have a motion. Is there a second? Second. Commissioner Mount, any other comments or questions? Madam Clark? Commissioner Mount? Yes. Commissioner Luker? Yes, ma'am. Mr. Woody? Yes. Mr. D? Yes. Chairman Mack. Yes. Motion carried. Thank you. Right. Thank you. Okay. Do we need to set a time for the recess? I just, I think it would be perfect just to say that. Just that should be fine. All right. All right. Well, we'll recess this meeting. Do I have a motion in to recess until after the work session? Move to recess the last board session. All right, is there a second? Second. All in favor say aye. 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 We've got just a few minutes and then we'll start our other. Okay, because we could be 
They only allowed so many of them. Then after they got a certain amount, then they said, you know, never again. And I think they used to grab, grab all the damn ones that are there. So I mean, there's fairly. Uh, I guess uh, you want one, all, all the way you have one is to buy one somebody else got. Uh, which means uh, it could be worth a lot of money. Thank you. Thank you. 
Okay, we'll come to order, and this is our uh, work session, Jackson County Board of Commissioners today, October 13th, our regular work session. First item is uh, item one, and I think we're going to, I'll let Mr. Adams introduce the topics. Um, I believe the first one is going to be a Zoom participant. Yes, sir, we should have, do we have Mr. Sorrell? He's there. That's I'm here. Uh, well, we do have Mr. Jeffrey Searle here. This uh, dates back to uh, Commissioner Woody had met Mr. Searle at a NCACC meeting, and uh, and it took us a while. I think we've had a pandemic in the middle of these conversations <laughs> and some other things, but uh, we were able to work it out, and uh, uh, Mr. Searle has been kind enough to come and talk to the board in regards to just um, update on statewide broadband initiatives. I, I also have Mr. Connolly online also. He just came in. Okay. Um, we have Mr. Connolly online and we have Mr. Price here too today to update the board about uh, potential some great grants that, that some of our local companies have applied for or are going to apply for. So having said that, I'll turn it over to Mr. Searle. Okay. Well, thank you very much for, for having me. And, uh, and you're right, we, we've uh, been talking for several months about about getting together and I am sorry that I cannot be there in person. Um, I always love coming up to Jackson County. My in-laws are uh, in a neighboring county so we're up in that part of the state a lot. Um, but uh, I'm joined today with um, Keith Conover who is uh, in that part of the state and lives there and works out of uh, Asheville and has been working closely with uh, with Don and, and others there in the county, along with um, the COG, uh, to improve broadband deployment throughout the region. So I wanted to give you a quick update on some of the things that we're working on and they're going on at the state level, uh, and then talk a little bit about um, our grant program, uh, our survey that's currently out. We have over 700 responses from Jackson County alone, which is exciting. And I'll tell you some of those results. And then um, if there's any questions, I'd be happy to. Uh, I know that um, <clears throat> we have 50 talk, so I will try to move quickly um, and just understand that there is a lot going on. And uh, yeah, I'll run out to you. Cover. I may not be able to cover all of it, but, but we'll take it our best. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so the first thing that we're, um, focused on right now is the great grant or the growing rural uh, economies with access to technologies grant. It was authorized and uh, funded by the legislature in um, 2018. We are on our second round of grants and then um, the General Assembly appropriated uh, $30 million uh, for a special supplementary round using CARES Act funding. So we are currently in the application uh, phase of that round. Um, right now, um, there are, let's see, today is, yeah, I'm losing track of days here in the, in the pandemic, but uh, we close out applications tomorrow, October 14th. And uh, um, we'll have a lot of work because there's a lot of applications pending. Um, right. 98 counties are eligible for funding. Uh, so uh, the demand is, um, and, is high for this particular round. Um, next slide, please. <clears throat> um, and then um, one of the things that I wanted to um, just cover quickly, if you're not uh, uh, um, familiar with our office, um, kind of stepping back here a little bit, um, our office published a state broadband plan in 2016, which sets out the strategy for the state to uh, achieve universal access 
Um, we engage in a number of partnerships and programs, including uh, with the Appalachian Regional Commission. And we've done a telehealth feasibility study, which we published recently. Uh, and we've got some other exciting news, I hope, coming up tomorrow. Uh, Keith is a member of our technical assistance team. He's developed a playbook uh, that uh, he uses to work with counties. Um, and what we try to do is disrupt the status quo, um, uh, empower the community to help itself with broadband deployment. There aren't really any levers out there for counties and uh, you're not alone. You've got uh, 99 other uh, um, counties in the state that are just as frustrated as you are that they can't put their hands on the lever to move the needle directly. So we've created a mechanism by which to do that. Um, and then part of that uh, help that we're trying to give all those counties is through data collection and mapping, not just relying on what's provided by the federal government, but doing uh, and, and uh, um, taking advantage of other uh, data that's out there, and uh, we've created several data sets, some indices, and, and some maps that you can find on our, our website, ncbroadband.gov. Uh, one of those initiatives is our survey that I'll talk about in a few minutes. Um, next slide, please. Uh, one of the things that we've done to try to disrupt the status quo is, is uh, creative partnerships. Keith um, led this initiative to uh, a match make here with um, Western Carolina University and uh, with Morris Broadband um, to utilize the uh, infrastructure and assets that Western Carolina had for its electrician, electricity uh, generation and distribution um, facility and uh, Morris uh, Broadband's expertise in, uh, in that business and uh, able to bring uh, high-speed connectivity to 3,500 uh, homes in Tullowy and potentially uh, expanding to 7,000 by the end of the project. Uh, Keith likes to brag, no state dollars uh, were used in the uh, creation of this program, no federal dollars either, so no taxpayer dollars at all. Uh, these are the types of creative partnerships that, um, that we like to, uh, that we like to um, develop. Next slide, please. So I mentioned mapping. Um, this uh, map here is a representation of some of the data that we received from the Federal Communications Commission. This data is provided to the FCC by the internet service providers. So uh, take it with a grain of salt. Um, but one of the things that it, it does give us is uh, some good information about where the significant problems in the state are. Those areas in red are where you see um, uh, unserved areas or areas that may not have the infrastructure um, available to deliver high-speed internet access. And this is, our, um, this is our first phase of attack right here. The, the, we're going after these areas hard, um, trying to raise money, find grant programs that will facilitate uh, the funding of broadband projects in these areas because um, to, to put it crassly, check it out. The worst of the worst um, out there. You Jackson. Can see Jackson County in the lower left. So this is inside the rescue it's squad building. building. Mm -hmm. Significant part of that uh, uh, you see is in, is in red. And, uh, they had all the doors open. There was more than 200. So there, next slide, please. Probably. It's behind the so the great grants is one of the ways that we're uh, attacking side. these areas and trying to uh, I think this provide be funding. <clears throat> We've um, distributed uh, over $26 million. They got really cool. Like, tier one counties. <laughs> um, we're connecting more than 21,000 households with this There's grant program. Frank Hugale. And, um, and then uh, the private sector investment. So we can use these in the campaign when you're around the exchange. Yeah. 22. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm getting. Uh, say, uh, uh, Holly, Holly Bowman. <laughs> Holly. Gosh. Can you hear me, Holly? He got his ass beat uh, or initially by God. this dude. He said they want to mute that, <laughs> And then he was out of the ring, and he beat uh, Chad down, so, and then um, he was out here gloating. Right. But he was, um, and Chad snuck up on him. So uh, that, that investment from the state dollars crazy, right? matched with $20 million in private sector investments. Um, Go ahead and mute her. But she can unmute. So. Well, that's fine. Not sorry about that. that. You got interrupted by someone. Okay, that, that's all right. That, that, that happens. Uh, I was going to just mention that $20 million in private sector investments to, to support that uh, $26 million in state uh, dollars that went to those projects. Next slide, please. 
I mentioned our um, our supplementary round using CARES Act dollars. Here's a quick timeline and deadlines. Um, the General Assembly did set specific deadlines for us to receive applications and to make awards. So we are uh, moving quickly uh, to get the, that money distributed uh, before the end of the year. Um, as I mentioned, applications close tomorrow. We should have all applications posted publicly uh, as statute on October 17th. So keep an eye out for that. Next slide, please. Other funding opportunities that, that we have been um, aggressively pursuing include uh, the U.S. Department of Agricultural RUS funds. I'm sure you all are familiar um, with, with that program, uh, but they've become more and more uh, aggressive on uh, trying to fund broadband projects. The state has done exceedingly well in receiving um, USDA reconnect funds. Um, next slide, please. Uh, here's, a, here's just a, a quick snapshot of some of those uh, programs um, where we've received funding. The only, um, there's one that's not on there, but it's in Moore, Moore County. Next slide, please. We also work closely, very closely with the Appalachian Regional Commission and they've um, funded a number of smaller projects across the region uh, and some of our uh, telehealth work there. Also some um, work that we're doing um, with the local libraries. Next slide, please. And then the biggie is coming up here in a couple of weeks um, on October 29th. Uh, the FCC will hold a reverse auction. Uh, they will distribute $16 billion in the first uh, round of that auction. Um, and they are targeting all areas that are unserved uh, under 25 megabits per second download and, and three upload. We have 20 North Carolina companies or companies that do business in North Carolina providing broadband services that have uh, qualified to uh, apply or participate in this reverse auction. Uh, we should know more by the end of November where uh, the, um, those awards were made. Next slide, please. This is just a quick snapshot for you of where a significant number of uh, the federal grants and state grants have gone uh, to date in, in the state. Uh, next slide, please. And then um, uh, the funding piece is, is um, reliant on good data. And I mentioned that earlier where we were trying to collect better data. So we have a survey out that uh, takes less than five minutes. It's online, but if you can't take it online because you don't have internet service, we also allow you to take it by phone. You can take it by cellular phone or landline. Uh, it's in both English and Spanish. On our website, we have marketing materials. If you would like to send uh, out uh, via social media or uh, print. Um, we have materials that are already developed that you can um, that you can use, and, and other counties have done this. One county in particular sent it out uh, a little placard uh, that has all the information in their uh, utility bills. Um, to date, uh, in Jackson County, we received 700 responses. Um, some interesting facts that we'll take away from, from that survey so far are that 44 percent of the respond, respondents from Jackson County are on DSL, which is extremely um, concerning, probably not surprising to you. 63% um, are uh, somewhat or extremely dissatisfied with their service. Again, not a surprise to you, but it's helpful uh, for, for us in our data collection. Uh, about 25% are paying anywhere between 60 and 100 bucks a month. Average download speeds are around 27 megabits per second uh, and upload about five. Um, of the 405 uh, respondents that took the speed tests, 67% um, said they had less than, uh, or showed less than 10-1 uh, uh, service and 84% less than 25-3 service. So why this is helpful, again, not surprising to you all, but helpful to us is because when we're looking at these grant programs, we need this data and we can use this data to carve out areas uh, that may be showing up served on the FCC uh, map, but that uh, but, but are, that are actually unserved, and then we can justify those locations for for funding. Now, in Jackson County, such a large part of the county is is unserved by the FCC's data, uh, so it may not be as significant for for you all. But uh, but I'm sure that there are still folks there that are in um, areas where a provider may say, well, we're serving you, 
um, but they're actually um, but they're actually not getting the service that, that they should be. So I can uh, I see that my 15 minutes is up. I'm happy to take any questions. Keith again is here from our office. He can take questions, and if there's uh, at some point a need for for uh, him to respond in person or in the county, he can do that also. Thank you again for your time. And, and Gail, uh, thank you for uh, having me uh, here. I know we, we had a chance to talk and meet several times and, um, and I just appreciate you including us in this conversation. Thank you. Thank you so much for taking your time. I know you're really busy right now. Um, when I think this map, Mr. Sorrells, is the best representation I've seen so far. I know when we got our county maps last time from the association, it looked like Jackson County had a lot more service than we actually have. And I think this one is a better reflection of our actual situation. And um, I had talked to the commissioner, um, the chair, I, I, his name slips my mind, from Madison County. Um, and they have been so pleased with their partnership. And I said, how did you get such extensive service? And it's because they have an electric co-op that they are working through. And I would assume that's the same with Cherokee on the sheet you showed us. What can we do? Because we have Duke Energy, um, I've talked to Lisa, Lisa Leatherwood, our, our local representative, and um, I said, is there any potential for us to do what these electric co-ops are doing? And she said, no. I mean, she just said flat out, no, this, that's not going to happen with, with Duke Energy. What recourse do we have? Mm -hmm. So I can uh, have Keith help me here in this because he's been working on the ground in the county uh, a lot on this issue. I would say with regards to Duke, we have been having recent conversations and it's just been as, as um, early as last week, we, we finally had a conversation with some senior level executives about how they can help. They've come forward and said they, they are interested in helping. Now, I don't think that they can do the same thing as the electric membership cooperatives and actually providing the service up in Madison, it's French Broad, but there are assets that they could uh, that they have that uh, that we could avail um, or we could utilize uh, for the deployment. Um, so that that's one thing we can continue to have a conversation with Duke. We won't take no for an answer there. Uh, we can follow up with you more on that. And then Keith, do you want to fill in on on some other uh, uh, ideas and? and you know? Sure. <clears throat> Absolutely. First, the projects in Madison are going so well and the funding is, is coming uh, as it is because in that case, French Broad Electric Co-op, when they built their fiber infrastructure, they accounted for splices. They peppered the landscape with splices um, with an eye towards broadband. That's critical if you're going to do distribution of broadband to the home. So when they created their network originally that linked up their substations, they had that in mind. And as a result, they are more prepared than most other co-ops, let alone places where you don't have a co-op. As far as Duke Energy goes, <clears throat> there was a bit of a challenge when Yancey and Mitchell did their fiber to the home projects with Country Cable, um, because unfortunately Duke Power was not brought into the project early enough. So for in, in relationship to the electric infrastructure in Jackson County, uh, without a, uh, a co-op or with, you know, maybe limited co-op activity, I don't know if uh, Haywood EMC might have some fiber that goes through Jackson. I will tell you that the there's a little bit for way, way Right, and, and when they designed their network, they did not pepper the landscape with splices. So it is not the same scenario. So what you would need is you would need uh, either an incumbent or a brand new company, let's say, you know, uh, Mars Broadband, for example, uh, goes after a grant. Let's say they go after a great grant. And we're gonna hear about great grants. I think, uh, I, I think Rich Price is gonna talk about some grants that are being applied for. I don't see those until they've been applied for, so I don't know about them. But let's say that Mars Broadband went after a grant. Then what would be critical there would be to bring in Duke early enough because in many cases in Jackson County, 
you do not have a lot of infrastructure on the poles. In some cases, it's just the telephone infrastructure which supports the DSL. And in a lot of cases, it's just the power and it's not even a cable alternative, which means there's room on those poles, which means it's not a, there won't be a lot of cost to add that infrastructure. Key there would be bringing in Duke early. Uh, you bring them in early enough on a project, they're very cooperative when they're not, when you don't bring them in, it is an interruption to their business plan and you can't really blame them um, for, for not necessarily putting something like that uh, on the front burner when they hadn't been pulled in to plan on it first. Yes, sir. Um, Mr. Turner, I do have a question. I, I have the uh, broadband service inventory up. The, and, and this is showing less than 25 megabytes per second. The great grant, is that, do you have to be less than 10 to qualify? Is that a correct? That's correct. Yeah, they have a, there's an overlapping provision where. So is there any conversation in Jackson County when we see a less than 10 megabytes, this looks different for us. And yeah. there's some question in regards to whether or not there really is 10 megabytes available versus the data that's out there. Mm -hmm. And so my, my basic question is, is there any movement with the great grant side to reduce that or to increase that to say a 25 megs or less? Yeah, there there is, um, and we and we look at twenty five megs and three down as um, because that's what the, the FCC program, the USDA programs will fund. The Great Grant hasn't gotten there yet, but it's slowly getting there. Um, they actually changed the definition to unserved to twenty five three in the Great Grant statute, but they still um, want or uh, prefer areas with less than ten one with a potential overlap. So 10% of the project can, can overlap with an area that's not, you know, has greater than 10-1. So we're slowly getting there, but there's been strong advocacy, not only from our office, but also from internet service providers to raise that, uh, raise that level. Because as you can see, as you pointed out in this map, uh, those providers would have a bigger geographic area. Uh, and that makes more sense to them to have a larger project than just a smaller project. Can I just add one thing to that, please? Uh, Rich Price and I had a discussion uh, about this. Um, we do have the ability to take uh, ineligible areas, uh, do some field testing, and potentially change those to eligible areas. Mm -hmm. Right now, in doing that, we will likely, we haven't done it yet, but when we do, we'll likely have to uh, include an appeal process for the incumbents to demonstrate, because obviously we can't go test every person's phone line or every person's DSL line in a given area. Um, but the fact of the matter is there is uh, room to take those, take an area and redesignate it. I know Rich is starting to work uh, on that. We're gonna work, we're gonna bring in, uh, <clears throat> we're gonna bring in uh, Russ from Region A to help out with that as well. So it's not like it's impossible, it just hasn't been done. And obviously when you're talking about FCC data that's been reported by an incumbent, we would have to make sure and, 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 and validate with them that that's the case. That the issue has always been the NTIA guidelines, which say if one business or customer can get that service at that speed, the entire area is considered covered. Uh, we, we've never agreed with that, but unfortunately, uh, it's the environment in which we operate. Yeah, that's, that's um, true. I should say, and I should have uh, started with, the statute doesn't simply rely on this data. The statute relies on, um, on this data plus anything else that the community or the provider can, can submit. So as long as uh, the applicant can substantiate that the locations it wants to fund with great are unserved or under that you know, 10 one, we can, we can, um, we can uh, fund those areas or locations. Other questions or comments? Um, Mr. Chairman, uh, oh, Commissioner Luger, go ahead. Yeah, hey, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Jeff, um, in reference to you, a moment ago, you were speaking about the thirty million and uh, those um, closing for those applications and ninety-eight counties. Uh, I believe you said there that those are, um, you know, to be distributed throughout. What is the process in order to make sure that that is fair and equitable? Um, amongst 
how those are split out. So the statute sets out a uh, scoring matrix and all applications are scored against that, uh, that matrix in the criteria that's in the matrix. Um, it depends on um, number of unserved households in the county, number of un unserved households that the provider wants to serve. Um, it uh, depends on how many uh, business or agricultural operations, you get points for that, you get points for, um, and then you get a multiplier if you provide a better or a technology that will deliver a higher speed, uh, your score can be multiplied. So uh, it's all standardized and it's uh, contained in the statute. Okay, is that is that based off of a percentage or population or how's that done when you're looking at the matrix? No, uh, the first two rounds, the statute, uh, the General Assembly limited the, the great grant to tier one counties. And then this special round, they opened it up to 98 counties. So it's all defined mm -hmm. the General Assembly, where we can go. With okay. uh, thank you. Mr. Woody, did you have a question or comment? Um, yes. I, as you can imagine, Mr. Soros, um, COVID has really put a spotlight on our lack of connectivity. Um, people sent home to work, schools, all those things. And I know you're hearing that statewide, but it has been a huge concern for us here. And um, I get asked frequently from our constituents, what are we doing to provide what we, you know, back in the 20s, I guess it was electricity. That's the same kind of issue we're facing right now. And um, I hope that I know you work very hard with this and continue to communicate to the state um, and, and our legislatures as we're doing with the um, Association of County Commissioners that this is essential work. It's not just, oh, we want to provide a nice service. This is essential service. And our, our people in Jackson County deserve this. And um, we have the most mountainous county in the state. And so if people in Raleigh just look at a map and say, well, there's connectivity here, they don't know there's a holler and there, and then there's a ridge between that next phase, which right. there is a barrier to connectivity. That's right. So um, we have issues that, that uh, are unique. Jackson County, and we really appreciate your advocating for us at every opportunity. Commissioner Woody, you're right. We've heard from, from people all over the state, and there, and a lot of the stories are heartbreaking. Um, and it's something that Keith and I work on all the time. I mean, I, we um, don't stop thinking about this. I'm actually 32 years old, uh, and if you can tell by the dark circles under my eyes, I just don't get much sleep. But um, because it's a depressing issue for the state. Um, we have worked closely with the governor's office recently. Uh, they are starting an initiative. We've helped support with uh, some uh, procurement, uh, negotiating and, and then procuring additional hotspots for students in some areas um, and bus Wi-Fi. And I know, um, you know, we're, we're, we're trying to triage this situation uh, currently, but obviously for, for the long term, we have certain long term goals and strategies that we'll continue to work with, uh, with you all on. Um, and, uh, and, and yes, it, there's, uh, there's not one technology, uh, there's not one solution, business solution that will work uh, in every county. So um, that's why we have folks like Keith working on the ground. So we know exactly what's going on. We can develop those relationships and we can move, move things forward. So um, we, we pledge to continue to work, work with you and, and the other commissioners and, and Don and Rich to, to improve things in Jackson County. Thank you so much. Any other comments or questions? Okay, we thank you all very much for your presentation. Thank you. So Mr. Chairman, I just, just for everybody's information, if, if we could just, Mr. Price, if you would just inform the board of the great grant applications that you know that are being submitted. Certainly, um, as of today, I'm aware of three grant applications for communities in Jackson County. 
Uh, the first is from SkyFi Wireless, which SkyFi was awarded a grant during the original round when Jackson County was eligible as a Tier 1 county. They're looking uh, for funding to support portions of four different communities. This would include parts of Dillsboro, parts of the Willits community, uh, Quest Ridge, and up into the Tuckasegee area. Uh, it's a total of about 245 homes, approximately. Uh, the second is Morris Broadband. They applied for funding to support portions of an area of the Coke Creek Road area, uh, and it looks like potentially around 100 homes for them. East, East Coke Creek? They have just said Coke Creek, um, so it, it more than likely would be that East Coke Creek area. Um, the third is a company called Comporium Communications. Comporium is the primary provider uh, in Transylvania County. Uh, they have been approached and worked with the Holly Forest community up in Sapphire. Uh, their interest is to bring fiber across the county line and be able to connect into the Holly Forest community, which would service approximately 636 homes. Uh, so right now, summarizing that, uh, that's roughly 980 to 1,000 homes that could potentially be serviced. Now, uh, can all three of those grant applications be fulfilled? It's probably not likely because, as you heard, Mr. Terrell, it's very competitive across the state. Uh, I would also encourage the board to pay close attention to what Mr. Terrell said early in his discussion. If you look at the maps used right now uh, to determine eligible areas for the great grant program, you'll see a majority of Jackson County appears to be served at that 10 megabyte download speed. And the majority of those people are served by a provider and are using DSL um, connectivity. Uh, we know intuitively and from and from uh, feedback across the county and feedback from yours truly, who used to be a customer of that particular provider, that we are not getting the 10 megabyte download speeds. So our, our, our challenge and our opportunity is to challenge those those areas. And you, you don't have to think much further than Tuckasegee, Caney Fork, Little Canada, East Laporte, all those areas in the central portion of this county where there is really no fiber service at all. And that's where we're really trying to focus. But keep in mind that none of those areas were eligible for great grants because they appear to, to be have access to 10 megabyte download speeds. And then finally, I'll share quickly that we are working on another project, economic development related, that if it goes forward, uh, we will be looking for funding from the Appalachian Region Commission to potentially do um, high speed wireless internet throughout the entirety of downtown Silva, Main Street, Mill Street, Bridge Park, and surrounding areas. And then um, we're using 12, a minimum of 12 right now, wireless hotspots all over the county, public schools, yes. rec centers, uh, act, river access points, the parking lot of Save More. All of those are still in use in areas that we're trying to encourage those who don't have service to, that they can go there to try to get their kids homework assignments and that sort of thing. And I'm happy to answer any questions that the uh, board may have. Any questions? Um, I do have a question about this this date where these grants are due tomorrow. Are those the ones that we have? That second group of money. That's correct. Under the okay. special, so the the, the second special, the second coming. the second round of great grants. Jackson County was not eligible for because we had moved to tier two. Yes. I but the special that. allocation, we are eligible okay. for. Tomorrow is the deadline. Yes. So my office has worked with all of these providers, as well as the Southwestern Commission and others to get letters of support, provide data, et cetera, that would support their application. So to my knowledge, they're all in good standing and should be submitted on time. Great. Thank you so much. Can I add one more thing, please? Yes, sir. <clears throat> just want to let you know that this past week we did a, a field monitoring visit like an audit on sky five because of the first round of great grant money that they got part of the process is monitoring how well they are progressing and whether they're not or whether or not they are uh, keeping the promises you know made during the application process and what we got to see was we got to see 
infrastructure, new infrastructure that was placed, it was all grounded properly. We got to see many uh, customers and areas that were now served. And we also got to hear that there's been an increase in uh, the amount of employees in SkyFi as a result of the grant work. Um, and I think Travis Lewis mentioned that he actually works with a career person in one of the colleges uh, to help make that happen. So that, that's a good news story. And I just wanted to share with you that it's an example of how the great grant process can work. And we hope to do more of it in Jackson. Well, I think uh, as, a, as a recipient of SkyFi recently, within the last month, um, I want just to share that we are very pleased with their service. And um, our old VSL was really slow, wouldn't download things. And um, I am so pleased to hear how well they're doing. But just to let you know, I'm a witness of that and I appreciate it. Well, thank you very much for all your time. All right, we're ready. We're ready. Thank you. <laughs> Next, we have our health insurance consultant, Mr. Mark Browder, here with Mark Free Brokerage. And uh, Mark is basically coming to give us an insurance update and also talk to us a little bit about wellness booking. All right. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Thanks for having me. Get away from this. So, we had it the last couple of days. So, I'm going to go through this material. Uh, page two is the first thing that I'm going to discuss. So uh, this is uh, an update from the 2019-2020 plan year on page number two. Uh, and there's a lot of information on this, but I'm only going to focus at the bottom of that spreadsheet. Uh, so claims were down about 5% compared to the prior year, even though we had significant run out claims uh, from the prior administrator. Uh, your stop loss contract really protected the county. So for every dollar, if you, you pay it in, you got a $1.22 back. So, Happy that we crossed it making money on that, right? Uh, and then finally, budgetarily, we were in uh, a good position. So, coming at the, the cost expectations uh, that we worked with your team on uh, turned out to be accurate, and uh, things were running in a positive position. So, that's good news compared to some other meetings that I've had with you in the past. If you go to the next slide, these are the claims for July and August of the current plan year that we're in. and. Claims remain uh, slightly down uh, by about 1%. Uh, self loss contract continues to deliver high value and budgetarily, we're, again, we're still in a positive position. So uh, the, the plan is running uh, well uh, relative to what we expected. Uh, we do anticipate there will be some uh, nominal trend increase going into 21 22, which is a normal trend increase, but not to the extent that we were facing. We were talking about 30 and 3% increases. So it should be manageable. Uh, so if things have gone well, we're very pleased about that. I'm going to talk about wellness for just a second. The, on page number four is just an overview of clients that we have that, was, that went through an evaluation of the trial market. The trial business journal uh, did an evaluation of employers under 500 employees and then employers from 500 to 1,500 <clears throat> within our clientele. Uh, and we have been heavily involved in the wellness strategies that these clients have been uh, incorporating into their benefits package. Uh, so the city of Salisbury was number two uh, out of the list of about eight or nine on this page. If you go to the next page, slide five, uh, Cabarrus, Cabarrus County was number three and Rowan County was number one based on the evaluation. So we wanted to take some of this uh, experience we've had and been working on population health management for over 20 years to talk about some of the things with staff uh, that we're going to be important, at least talking about incorporating the 21 22 plan. Slide number six, just as a reminder, uh, and this is from the Journal of American uh, Medical Association, and it's a determinant of health. And certainly, people have genetic predisposition, certainly bad luck, environment, and so forth. But a lot of how our health uh, goes is based on how we consume food, what we consume, exercise, and so forth. So that's what we're focused on, is trying to help employees get into a better place. If you go to slide number seven, the last, last page of the material. So the dominant theme on slide number seven is you see a lot of, of health conditions that are related to weight. 
uh, and it drives cardiovascular disease, diabetes, obesity, hypertension, uh, heart disease. A lot of this is related to weight. So we, we spend a lot of time focusing on one, how can we improve the weight and health of the population? And how can we help those that are at risk uh, with on-site on -site resources? So today you have a point system for your wellness initiative. About 20% of the employees, 100% of the employees participate in this. What we're going to meet with uh, the staff in the next few months is to talk about how can we put in a more uh, accountability-based strategy, uh, one that focuses on improving the health of the population that provides incentives. Uh, there are budgetary allocations to this. We're going to talk about how it impacts the budget, what you can expect from the population health change, uh, but we've got a lot of data to back up what we're doing. So we usually incorporate data analytic strategy behind that to compare those that are participating versus not participating and how their claims perform. <clears throat> Certainly, when we talk about wellness, you think about uh, return on investment. But what is uh, more important in our opinion is what happens to the health of the population and the quality of life. So uh, we, we are successful as a team to change the lives to move them in a better place uh, and provide them uh, with opportunities uh, for self-help, self-management, external resources on, on the ground to, to really uh, put them in a better place. Any questions of me at all? Generally, it's, uh, it's a good story to tell. I have a question about the claim for a little bit lower. Is, is that something you're seeing across your clients? Because I'm wondering mm -hmm. how many people aren't going to see the doctor because of COVID, at least for March. April, May, if that is maybe one variable that could be. A lot of the, a lot of the services that could be deferred, uh, elective services, you, know, you may need a knee replacement, there may be a knee done, but they're not of the catastrophic nature uh, that can get a claim. So people have uh, cancer, oncology, uh, cardiovascular disease, heart disease. Uh, all of the big services were still going on during COVID. Uh, and uh, we saw clients with claims uh, increases during this period of time were pretty substantial, 10 to 15 20 percent. So yes, there are things that can be deferred. A lot of those things that are deferred are office visits, uh, or you know, doctor's visits that aren't big cost tickets. Big cost tickets are someone who is a lady with breast cancer that may be half a million paid or a thousand dollars. Those claims were still going on during this time. Yes, maybe a slight dip, but you had basically a two year period of time where you had relatively good claims traffic. Ultimately, it will change, it can change. Um, so, but no, I mean, we, we've had plenty of people that are going to agree this year uh, because they've had significant high claims traffic. Thanks. Any questions? Other questions? Good. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Thank you, Mark. So next we have Mr. Ellis to come talk to the board about a uh, proposed dog park and pastures. I've got several items that were included in your packets, but I'd also just received a PowerPoint here in the last day or two from Vision Casher, so we'll, we'll defer to that in, in a few minutes. But uh, having said that, I'll turn it over to Mr. Ellis. Thank you. Okay, right, good afternoon. Just want to get in front of you. We've been approached by Vision Casher and or a uh, willing donor to possibly construct a uh, dog park at the uh, Hatcher Threat Center complex. Um, there's a couple of uh, uh, layouts that we've been, been looking into, one being the one in front of you right now, which is the one that's actually the big field beyond the, uh, the Hatcher's Pond and behind the library. Um, after looking at this one, and I had a chance to talk with you, Don, but I did get a chance to talk with environmental and or uh, code enforcement. That is an active well that is there um, with it being serving the, actually the, uh, the senior center. With it being an active whale, you cannot have anything within a 50 foot radius of that whale. So with that being said, with it being about an acre and a half now, it drops it down to about one to five acres. So, and also there is no, like in uh, Don said, there is no bathroom there other than the senior center and the library. So that site probably is going to be off limits unless we talk about otherwise so th that was this this site was the original site 
that vision catchers Correct. approached the county with. And so what I did was I, I asked staff, planning and other staff, to evaluate the site and also to evaluate other property to try to find out or figure out the best potential location for a dog park. Well, staff had come back and we occasionally have parking issues over here, plus there are no facilities, direct restroom facilities here. So staff came back and initially recommended that we look at another location. Um, and so we, we've got a couple other locations we're going to discuss. Well, prior to coming here, I, I went and met on site with staff and we walked around and I, I just asked Rusty to reevaluate this site because there was potential for the dog park to be larger here. And so that's well, where, where there was. Yeah. Now that's where Rusty has come back and confirmed what we thought may be the issue that the well would reduce it. So at this point, between staff recommendations and obviously restrictions, obviously restrictions associated with that well, we would not recommend this. And then we also got back from, uh, from that being center of the, uh, the complex would actually it's about the same size as that what will now be with the restrictions of the well and the catcher pond with that, with that area it's about a 0.32 acres is what the one would be there below the playground which will have uh, a walking trail on either side of the dog park as well and the bathrooms there and the playgrounds there so there is ample parking also on right now there is ample parking that we'll be able to use from the rec center but uh, the main focus on that one is bathrooms are located in a, in, a, in a short walking area as well as walking trails on both sides to where you can have easy access to that dog park uh, the left hand side of that uh, is a, actually a small dog park area separated by a fence for the uh, all, uh, large dog park area I think uh, Don's handing you out the, uh, the presentation that Vision Catchers is, uh, will use this as a fundraising uh, tool for uh, for businesses and donors willing to donate to this area in here. So I think they have to broke down to around, I want to say probably about forty something thousand dollars is what these, what them and his uh, people have come up with actually to uh, fundraise for that. Um, yeah, 42 three is what he's actually come up with. And then Don, you can, uh, if you want Yes. So the, the people at home saying this? No, because it's live. Okay. Stop sharing. You can, if, if you want to stop sharing, you can do it again. Just share screen. Oh, Randy Diller. Oh, but, but this has been a big topic for All right, there's the dog park. So this is uh, the, the presentation that Vision Cashers, I believe, is they, they this presentation was actually discussed with the leadership class that we participated with today. Um, and so ultimately, it is going through and talking about um, a dog park being a public park is typically fenced and and also it has off leash areas and things of that nature. Um, this is going through talking about their, what their mission is, uh, is to establish a fenced in off leash dog park area where well behaved canine can exercise. They do go through and look at the need um, and then they ultimately go through and look at the Central amenities, which they were trying to go for one acre or more. And that, at the end of the day, going back and, uh, and the reason staff was going through and evaluating different locations was Vision Cash's original goal was an acre or more. Currently, right now, the site is about how big? The so one below the playground, right? One, three, two. Yeah. And so, um, so these are the facilities that they were looking for. Um, as far as the amenities, given examples, as far as those double leash gate, the waste disposal area, seating, water bowl, signage. Uh, also, they're looking to have this 
type of entry science here, regulations, things of that nature. Um, health and safety rules, I would say this, as long as these comply with our current rules, it would be good. And then ultimately you can see, um, we had discussed with them, this is the location now that, that I believe that staff and vision catchers are all agreeing that would be the appropriate location. And um, so I just wanted to provide the little bit more details of what they're looking to build out and, and really fundraise for. And um, just give you a little bit of views. A couple of amenities here that here, that there is a restroom located there, which ultimately that along with the recreation parking right next to it is actually what makes this area uh, made our staff really recommend this area over the previous areas to start with because having those other amenities would just be better for people that are walking their dogs and then finally the budget that the, that's being estimated would be about a forty-two thousand three hundred dollar budget that currently right now um vision casters are saying they're willing to discuss and do fundraising efforts and i i've had conversations with Mr. Rothschild, and we would have to go through and have some conversations with them about as long as their fundraising efforts comply with our, we do have a naming policy and, uh, and things of that nature. I think they would just name certain like benches and things of that nature in this facility when they do their fundraising efforts. And they have also put together, uh, you know, a, a donation and sponsorship concept and idea in which they would try to fundraise. Um, about the only other item that's been brought up by Mr. Rothschild is that, you know, if they do do, do this fundraising effort, um, they would like to, the initial concept was to lease the space or get the space guaranteed to be used as a dog park for long term. Well, a couple of things we have to look at is we do, we, we don't own this land at this point. We, we lease this land from Cashew Valley Community Council. and. I think ultimately we can argue this is a recreation purpose. We have that lease through, I think, 2044. So we have it a while. So I think we can utilize this space for um, for this purpose. But my conversation with Mr. Robshaw is, is I think we would just have to work in trying to guarantee how long we try to maintain the dog park. And if and when we ever needed to reprioritize that property, then we could either talk about relocating the dog park and or you know refunding the money to a nonprofit or something that we needed that space for another county use but i think there's a way we could work it out to where they could fundraise and ensure that money is going to be used for the purposes that it's fundraised for any questions so they they know that we don't own it yes okay correct and and i i'm from what you have said, it doesn't infringe on any future plans for your rec center. As of right now, no. When we met a couple of months ago prior to COVID, when we had our master plan, this this area was not even contained okay. any thoughts of any building or anything that we would use for you know uh, warm up for uh, baseball and stuff like that. So it is an area. The reason we look at the area behind this yeah. that pond. Right. And it was actually bigger, and now yeah. knowing all the yeah. which is good. We needed that area where this is proposed now. Same area that we can put it behind Cashers Pond would be about the same size. So if we had to in the future for some reason, it could always go back to that area. So, so but if we move over there, then we're going to have to deal with parking yeah. issues. Parking and bathroom. Bathroom. I think the trail. Yeah. I mean, I don't even have the dog, but. The fact that it has a trail to walk yeah. the dog plus that's a nice in the parking at the slot as well. Oh, yeah. So, so I guess then our next step, next step is y'all approve it, and then Don will go back to uh, vision captures and uh, sit down with them to get the parameters and what exactly they're, they're asking for the county. So, any other questions about the concept? Take it up. Is bigger than what we're talking about. Yeah. Like I said, that's the size that we can get anywhere within our, our footprint, I'll tell you. 
And I, it looks from those pictures like it's wetlands just down that bank. Is that where the street is on? Yes. Anything else? Thank you. So I, I would ask, I know that, that is the board favorable for us to, I just want to make sure. Yes. Thank you. I think next, uh, for the sake of time, uh, we have a participant for the uh, for item five that has logged on from what Mr. Adams has described to me uh, that we probably need to go ahead and take care of item five next. And Mr. Posen still just hang around. <laughs> we have to unmute her and carry them. They can unmute themselves. So, Ms. Perkins, can you unmute yourself? Uh, yes, I'm here. This is Terry okay. Perkins. All right, Donna. Yes, sir. While, while we're doing this, I, I'm going to pass out another item. What you had included in your packets is the uh, is the tabulated and certified bid time. And I've asked Ms. Perkins, and, and I, I appreciate Ms. Perkins. She is our lead architect for the Animal Rescue Center. And this is her day off, her week off. And she has uh, been kind enough to... Uh, come and, and be available to the board to discuss our our bid path. So what you do have included in your packets, and it's also online here, is the certified bid path. Terry, can you see that? Yes, I can. Okay. And so if you would, Terry, just uh, uh, would you just summarize what we're looking at here, please? Sure. Um, these, uh, these are the bids that were received. Uh, publicly for the for the public bid opening for the Animal Rescue Center and the Green Energy Park. Uh, all aspects of that project were bid together, so the new building as well as the, the full Green Energy Park. Um, these are listed in order uh, from low to high, H&M constructors being the apparent low bidder. Um, there was quite a spread between the low bid and the high, as you'll see. Um, but in analyzing, especially the, the Animal Rescue Center portion of the project, the, the low bidder, uh, in, in, in my opinion, does have a, a cost per square foot for that type of building to be expected. Um, so, so my professional opinion is that there's nothing to be alarmed about with that uh, low bid number. The, um, there's several alternates you can see that were bid as part of the project. This was really done in an effort um, to provide some options to the county uh, should you wish to take any of these alternates. Um, I'll, I'll just briefly talk about each one. Alternate number one is to provide a backup generator for the Animal Rescue Center itself. Um, so that it's a little bit of a, a plug and play type design if you can imagine you can add that generator at any time in the future. The building is designed within the base bid to receive that generator. So just the piece of equipment with the transfer switch is part of that alternate. Alternate number two is an epoxy floor in the dog kennel portion of the building. Um, that is, uh, the, the base bid includes a sealed concrete floor that slopes to the drains in those animal uh, dog kennels, but the epoxy floor um, does provide some durability to that floor surface and makes it a lot easier for the staff to clean. So we, we included that as an alternate. Alternate three is, is a radiant floor in the dog kennel portion. Um, this is a, a, a bit of an unusual thing to include, but given the, the um, availability of the methane gas, and we're already using the methane gas to heat the building and provide uh, hot water for the building, so we wanted to include this as an option for the county, uh, should you wish to include this as well. Uh, and with the weather there and the winters, it, it would be a nice, uh, nice thing to have. Um, uh, alternate number four is a polished floor in the kennel. So alternates two and four, you would not take both of. You would choose, uh, they're simply options for the floor surface in the dog kennels, and they have everything to do with cleanability and durability of that floor surface. Alternate number five is a prefabricated restroom building uh, to serve the Green Energy Park. There are obviously restrooms in the Animal Shelter, um, Animal Rescue Center, but just for the walking trails and the rest of the Green Energy Park, this would be a, a public restroom building. 
And then alternate number seven is a prefabricated storage building, which would uh, consist of um, several storage units, uh, so to speak, that so it would be shared among the Green Energy Park and the nonprofits and the Animal Rescue Center. On the, the last column there, uh, the walking trails, those are the, the walking trails atop the abandoned um, landfill. And we asked for unit pricing on that and, and, um, and did receive it in some different formats. So we just wanted to share exactly what was received. Uh, so every bidder provided clear cost on that, but in slightly different form. So we've, again, we just provided that exactly as we received it. Don, is there anything else you'd like me to describe about that? No, I, I wanted the board to do, and what you're here for too, is when we start, I'm gonna now go into the, the second part where I've sent out the, what does this mean to our budget and where are we at as far as the actual budget versus the bids? And the board may start getting into discussions a little bit more about these alternates. So Carrie, that's really why I wanted you to be here was to make sure we understood the alternates in case they started in case the board started making some decisions towards that. Sure. So what I'll do is um, if, if I want to come off of this bid tab. Uh, I'm, I was very pleased the number of bids that we've gotten and uh, uh, we had uh, multiple bids and, and a lot of interest in this project. So that's that's actually I, I thought it was very good. Um, so I'm going to do this and then I may have to get Heather to help me um, make sure that it's shared with the public. We, uh, I believe, probably can see that. So, Carrie, can you see that? Yes, I can. Okay. So, what I tried to do is break this budget down just to show the board uh, what's available. So, what you have in this first column is our base bid, and this is the low bidder and trail cost of four million ninety-three thousand dollars. Of course, adding in the architect fees, the engineer fees. Uh, the McGee engineer fees, which is associated with the uh, methane gas line. And then our hazmat and permitting fees. We do have some hazardous materials that we got to remove from one of the buildings. And then equipment and furniture estimates and then signage. Um, then moving on down the estimate for uh, this security system, this 146, what it includes is installation of data cabling. It includes um, excuse me, the phone system itself. It includes a video security system. Um, and these are the ones that kind of, the, the costs are a little bit higher than I thought. It does include a card swipe system. Um, and now that's gonna be somewhat important when you're dealing with trying to share space with nonprofits and being able to control entries and exits. And then it also does have some AV costs associated with that. Uh, shipping containers. Um, the shipping container cost, that's where we're going to buy these shipping containers and they're going to be the replacement storage for the green energy park. And so that is just something that really has to be done. And then I'm requesting a 7% contingency for this project and that's based upon the 4,093,000. So the total, what I would call minimum cost that, that need to be available for this project is 5,321,254. You have budgeted 5,390,000, which would leave 68,746 available above your budgeted amount. Now, going through and looking um, in the alternates, uh, this first cost though we didn't discuss in the alternates is, this is the cost, uh, these are actual estimated costs to, remove, to move the two kilns uh, basically up there on the backside of the uh, and, and again, this is why I put it down for discussion. You know, this first number is the minimum cost and then the rest of these are up for discussion. 
So that would be to move the two kilns, also to build out a carport. One of the, the kilns would be need, needed to be under a carport. And also to put fencing on the back side of what's now the SRC to separate it from the SRC. If you recall, our plan was to continue using that SRC while we're constructing this facility. So we try to move the kilns up there, then I need a separation from, from the SRC. Uh, and then you can see alternates one, two, three, five, and seven. Now, if you notice, I just put in there the 49,600,000 so for alternate two, the epoxy floor. I did put in my note down here that polished concrete floor is not included in these totals. I highly recommend that we go with the epoxy floor. That, that just long term, it's going to preserve the animal rescue center floor itself. And um, ultimately, if we do anything, it's it's worth the additional money above the $28,300. But ultimately, if you were to fund everything, the car, the kilns, carport fencing, alternate one, the backup generator, alternate two, the epoxy floor, alternate three, the radiant floor, alternate five, the, the public restroom, and alternate seven, the storage building. That's a total of 407, which the total budget would be 5,728,000, and that leaves me a shortfall of $338,726. So what you have here is I have 68,746 available for the 407, meaning it's available in current budget for $407,000 worth of needs. If the board does not fund the entire project, I would, uh, my priorities here would um, basically be the epoxy floor. Um, I just, I truly believe we need the epoxy floor. And then um, ultimately the public restaurant. Uh, you know, at the end of the day, that's a prefab building. You're building a walking trail Although I know you could walk down to the Animal Rescue Center, this public restroom is up by the trail. And I just, I think we need to build this public restroom and we're gonna encourage people to park there and walk. And so that would be my first two priorities. And then past that would be the generator. Um, and then the storage building, a reminder on the storage building there, that's gonna provide storage, outside storage for the nonprofits. If you recall, we have a nonprofit office and we rely on our partnerships with these nonprofits. And so we didn't build them storage inside the building. These are not much more complicated than the storage building, those rental units that you see on sides of the roads here. And, and we're providing multiple units because we work with multiple nonprofits and we're just trying to give them on site storage. So I would include that in a pretty high priority. And then ultimately the kilns. Um, and, and the carport would be next, and then the radiant floor would be last of my priorities. And so having said that, Mr. Chairman, I'm turning it back over to the board for discussions. Um, overall, I thought we had a lot of good bids. I think the alternates are doing what their purpose is, is to give us choices within the existing budget. And uh, it looks like we have a project, no matter what this board decides. I mean, unless you choose not to do the project, we have funding available for some version of this project to move forward. Okay. Anybody want to just go ahead and say your feelings about the alternates? Um, it looks like the budget, as far as the base project come under, came in under budget. So uh, we do have the alternates considered. Where, where's the public restroom going to be located? Is it, let, me, let me rephrase my question. It's a public restroom. It's not located above the old landfill physically. No. Okay. It's it's literally, you know where Tim's office is? If you're facing his trailer, okay. it's to the right. Okay. okay. And so it's closer to that trailhead. Gotcha. Okay. That's what I was thinking about. For sure. They can't yeah. build the well, yeah. I might just no, but I didn't know. <laughs> but it you, sounded you, like it would be for the trailer. If you recall, we got public parking down there. So the yeah. idea being is, that's also where yes. the ADA accessibility is for the lower half there. So it's, it's right there where there'll be ADA parking and everything. There'll be a bathroom, a public bathroom where you don't have to enter another facility. Well, I just say personally, I've had some experience with radiant floor 
which has not been a good experience. And um, I, I just don't think that that's a good a good cost. I think in the end it could cost you money. Um, other than that, I'm okay with the other the other alternates. That was my question too. Uh, what other heating system would be available if we didn't go with the regular floor? Well, the well, it's fully heated and fully heated. We're using the boiler heating system. Well, hey, Carrie, can you explain our heating system, please? Oh, sure. Yeah, there's, we've actually specified a dual fuel boiler so that it makes use of the, the uh, methane gas uh, so long as it's available. Um, and then it can switch over to natural gas, uh, really, even as the staff or as Tim chooses, you know, just for the efficient use of the methane. So it really is a it really is a great system because it's it's taking advantage of the the fact that we're located near a, a landfill which is already capturing methane, um, and then and then but doesn't lock you into that long term. So it can also be run on natural gas. So the building is fully heated and cooled, and methane is also used to heat uh, water in the building. So the dog kennels. Just to answer the question about how else would it be heated, it, the dog kennels are heated now. Dog kennels. Um, have kind of an indoor and outdoor portion, you know, with a little small transfer door that a dog can go through to get to the outside portion. The staff can open and close that little door as they wish and depending on weather. So the outdoor portion, if we were not to do the radiant floor, the outdoor portion would not be heated uh, because it's outside, it is covered. Uh, and that's, that's really a very common setup um, that, that you can see in, in other animal facilities or boarding facilities. Um, so the, the radiant floor would provide some heat at the floor level on that outdoor portion. That that really would be the benefit there is that then the the, the dogs can go inside or outside in the cold weather if, if need be. The, the request from the health department staff or the animal control staff was that it allows them to leave the doors or the, the animals outside longer, but Without the radiant floor, when it gets cold, you just bring them to the inside. Other thoughts? So your top three again, Mr. Manager, were 49.6 for the epoxy, the 26.4 for the storage building, and also the 80,200 for the public restroom. Those top three. Maybe not in that no, order. There was a, I'm sorry, epoxy floor, public restroom, and actually the generate. But, but I could, the storage building is pretty important also. I, honestly, you know, for $26,400. Uh, the partnership that we rely on with the nonprofits yes. it's fairly important also. Again, the generator is important. Uh, obviously, if the power goes out, but the generator is also important for emergency management and for if we have issues for where power goes down, uh, countywide. It, it, it's just important to have backup power to heat and cool animals. If you can't, you're not able. Let's say it's dead of summer or dead of winter. Okay. And if power goes out, then you, you have issues. You will have to figure out what to do with those animals. And so the generator is an important issue also. Um, I was wondering about, I know um, that uh, ARP has the building and storage already. And um, they, they take nice care of that and all to the right of the bridge park. So the Could those be moved? Um, by the time we do all of that, I'm not. I mean, they were prefab. I know they brought them in there. Um, we're not. I'm not sure of the space is designed for yeah, that. I mean, I I'd have know. to go back and look. It's a, um, <laughs> but they 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 keep them looking nice. And yeah, I, I I don't. I'd have to go back and ask. I know we have a pack. If we don't build these, okay. Yes. Then what we are doing is we're grading it out. I'm still going to have a power conduit over to the area. Yes. Uh, I'm going to have it set up that it can be built. Okay. okay. Um, so we'll do everything but the building except that's what this last twenty six thousand dollars is. 
is the metal building itself. And then what I was planning on doing was using county staff to go ahead and finish out lighting oh, okay. and things of that nature. Yes. So I try to save costs. Sure. Uh, I mean, ultimately, I was giving you priorities um, if you choose to reduce the budget. Uh, the request is, is $338,726. Um, you know, we can also go to the kilns. I know there can be a fundraising effort with kilns if they're trying to move it, but it just really depends upon what your goal is here. This is for $52,000. You're literally in a set period of time, you're going to be fully functional with those kilns. Well, I mean, we'll need that cover. Um, it's a brick fire camp, wood fire camp. And if you don't have that cover over it, yeah. I've, you know, I've been involved with the one at SCC and um, and then I've been up there with Western News, the one at the Green Energy Park. And uh, you've got to feed wood into it, rain or shine. So you, and, it, and over time, it would disintegrate. With, But, but the kilns themselves can be rebuilt. I think, I mean, I've gotten so what, confirmation from Western Art Department. So what this price really includes is an individual coming in and recapturing some of that material, yes. the kiln material. Yes. Now realize we won't have that opportunity. You can't do that over a period of time, I mean, because Contractors are going to come in, and in their contract, they have demolishing and removing. Okay. So the way this is set up, if, 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 the way this would work is we would immediately bring these individuals or this contractor, subcontractor in, and they would start pulling and taking what they feel like they can reuse and immediately get everything that can be reused out of the way of the general contractor. Okay and it would be done in a short period of time now if you were going to follow if you're going to do a fundraising effort or try to do this over a period of time what i can't guarantee you is access to anything that's sitting down there sure. because the contractor is going to want to come in and you know at a certain time they're just going to demolish it and throw it all away and so unless western can walk in in the next two months or not even two months in the next month and claim it all and try to save it, then you won't have that opportunity to do that. So I'm just trying to let yeah, you know. I can't speak new. for them on the time frame. I mean, that's not fair for me. Yeah. Because I don't know. Yeah. So the now, let me ask this. There's also kilns, electric kilns that are in storage and have been for several years mm -hmm. that were bought with an initial grant never been used and they're in storage up there is there a location plan for those i do not have all i was trying to do is recreate it right. and then i've we created have. enough storage yeah. that tim can move that stuff out of storage but long term to figure out where those kilns are going to go it's going to really be dictated in regards to where um how that src space ends up yes okay because what's kind of worked out perfect in this conversation a little bit is we have those concrete pads that are on the back side of the R or src now that actually work perfect for kilns to sit on because they're concrete pads they're flat and you it's really almost pre-made to build the kiln on sure. and we have enough space to, to literally just cut the back end of that the src off and still use the remaining space and so whether or not we have additional space for those other kilns will be dictated with about what eventually happens to the rest of the SRC. Okay. Okay. Other thoughts? Who do we need to vote on this? Um, Carrie, in the uh, bid specs, um, 
what's the, what's the standard time? We're, I hope we've done sooner than this, but what's the standard time to award and go into contract and so forth? Uh, we didn't lock you into a time frame, okay. but we, we did say that we would do this quickly, that we, we were asked that question at the pre-bid meeting and, and said that we didn't anticipate any, any delay on it. And let me ask you this, Carrie, what would it, it, is there a way to, when do we have to, if for some reason or another the board wanted to discuss some of these issues a little bit more, is there a potential way that we could look at the minimum cost, get the contract going, and then, you know, not sure. delay a long time, but delay for a couple of weeks if we needed to for the, the alternates? Uh, yeah, you could always um, even get under contract for the base amount and then add any of the alternates by way of change order. And, and the reason I say that, the first step would be to award the parent low bidder and then authorize us to go and negotiate the contract. You know, we have to come back to you with a full contract and we have enough money in the budget to, to move forward with the, the base contract without the alternates. That sounds like a, a reasonable path to go down, personally. So I'll go ahead and, and move forward with trying to award the contract on the base bid and then consider these alternates at a later time as a change order or or approve them. Yeah, I mean, I'm will just buying a couple of things. I'm sorry? Will, will that affect the start of their site preparation or anything? Yes, everything, everything, <laughs> the, you know, more we delay, the, the more it'll delay starting. I, I guess what I'm trying to say is, is if I could talk to Carrie a little bit more, we could potentially put this on the next agenda. We could do a word of the, the, the parent low bidder um, with the understanding we're going to come back and make final decisions on, I, I still, it would need to be the next meeting. It would need to be first meeting in November. We don't, I'm not buying this month. I'm buying right. a couple of weeks in these conversations. Well, we meet next week. We meet next week. We, yeah. Yeah, we can do it next week. We can. We can come to some kind of understanding. I see. If, if, this is probably a question. If, if, if we do these by change order, well, that was said. Yeah. Somebody said that. I know. That's are these. How long are these prices good for? Is really what I'm wondering because I know how that works. Now, I, I don't. You're not even wanting to do that. Well, I'll have to go back and see how the comp change orders generally could have additional costs. Exactly. That's why I'm asking my question: Is that would these prices be good if? I, I don't know what we're going to do for sure. Or the original contract for the low bidder that was 5.321 million, and then if we took another two weeks to evaluate the. Hey, Terry, does, is there going to be a difference between Monday and November 3rd in these conversations? Uh, I don't think so. I'm. I'm I don't want to give you the wrong answer, but I don't. I don't think that that would be a problem. I, but I do think that if if it's possible to approve to award the low bidder now, I think that would be wise to do, so that they can go ahead and lock in all of their pricing, yeah. and um, and and then the change orders. I I mean the, the alternates. I I wouldn't think that there would be a, a big difference in that amount of time. There's not an issue if we talk to them about bidding, you know, the base bid, like I'm saying, but then by November 3rd, making final choices on the alternates. I mean, you really can't let a lot of time go by anyway. As someone mentioned, I mean, they, they would need to know, um, especially items like the epoxy floor, for instance, or the radiant floor. Those, are, those would affect all of their sequencing and scheduling for the rest of the building. Yeah, um, yeah, that's a change order. That's right. Yeah, we, we don't need to be, I would request that the board make the decision by in the next two meetings. <laughs> and then, uh, What's the name? I think you uh, can. What is the, uh, she's here. Okay. I'm just waiting. I'm not. I'm just saying she can, she can hear. Ms. Perkins, uh, Commissioner needs has a question. Sure. Uh, between the, the epoxy floor and the, what do you call it? Polished concrete floor. Polished floor. 
What's your thoughts there? Well, so so both of them, uh, the, there's a really issues of uh, ease of cleaning and keeping a healthy environment for the animals. So um, the better the staff can clean, the healthier the animals are going to be. Uh, it's already stressful for animals uh, to be in an animal facility like this with, um, and there's you know there's a high amount of bacteria that can be passed from animal to animal. So okay, both. Both of those make it a lot easier to clean. The main difference is that the epoxy floor is applied to the top of the concrete and flashes up vertically to create an integral base. Uh, so any kind of cracks or crevices between the wall and the floor are then eliminated and sealed up. So um, hands down, the epoxy floor is the healthiest and easily cleaned kennel floor you could Does put it in last there. Longer? Yes. Well, last, I mean, concrete lasts a long time, but concrete can crack. Uh, so the epoxy, you know, is more durable in that sense. So, um, so but I'm going to take this further durable in the sense, understanding we get inspections, Commissioner, it's that come in. And if we have issues with these panels, we have to, we have to maintain them. We have to paint them. We have to do certain things. So going back to, I know we're talking about keeping it cleaner, but that's part of our inspections, correct? That, that we have to abide by. Is that that's correct? right. Carry that. That's, yes, that's the, that's correct. That's the, the reason I'm trying to say that it made it, it, it. I understand that. Yeah. The cleanest floor and the best floor I've ever seen really is over at Ingalls and Bank. It's a polished floor. <laughs> it's absolutely beautiful. And uh, the only problem I've ever had with epoxy floor. We had one in a field house that we put down. And after about three years, it, it started cracking just like you was worried about the concrete cracking. And now water would start getting under that. And then it started cracking more. And so for long, moisture was working under it. And at some point we had to peel the whole thing up. And uh I understand you how you put it down and you can put different plates, make it different colors or whatever you want. But uh, my working for that well, it was not good at all. Yeah, and I, you know, I, all I can really say to that is, I mean, there's obviously a lot of different epoxy floors on the market. Uh, what we specified is a Sherwin-Williams product that we've had good success with in the past. It also, has a lot to do with the the actual installation. Um, if if you can you can speak even with the Cashers Humane Society, they've had uh, some trouble with their epoxy floor, and um, and my understanding from them is that they they really do feel like it was an installation issue uh, rather than the product. And so um, all those pieces come together. I, I've had I've had poor luck as well with just the concrete. Uh, installation in animal shelters. So um, both both can can be problematic if you don't have the right products and the right people, you know, installing it. Um, so, uh, you know, all I can really say about that is we, we've done our best to specify products that we've had good success with and that we're comfortable with from a warranty standpoint and that, um, you know, we're, we'll stay involved with the construction through every step to make sure that we're comfortable with how it's installed. Right. But the, the, the big thing, it really is, because uh, I hear you about the polished floor, um, and, and polished floors are fantastic. And, and I mean, that's one of the reasons we included it as an alternate. I would be comfortable if, if that were the way you wanted to go. It's really where the walls meet the floor, it, it, where the difference is between epoxy and just the polished concrete. And, and, in, a, and in a dog kennel, they're so small, you know, you've got you've got three instant three sides where the wall meets the floor, where we would have to keep an eye on that. Question about the kilns. This, these electric ones that you're talking about. They're in storage that they've now been used. Okay, so the, the existing kilns out there are wood fired outdoors and exposed. I assume these electric ones, though, would be some sort of structure around them? Yes, oh, yes. And they can't just be cardboard and. It, it would be problematic, I think. I mean, I've used kilns for. I think, but anyway. Um, 
the electric kilns need to be in yeah. an enclosed that's, that's, because that's, of the elements and you're, it's it's going to rust. Yeah, so no, that's what I thought. I just thought they I get I you know they get up to very high degrees of fire. Okay. So um, and then that's on a good the question. the existing ARF buildings and storage building, have we asked them about potentially because I think those. Did, have they been moved before? Did they used to always be at Ingalls in the parking lot and had it? So, I don't remember what they had over there, though, but it seems well, like I remember been, some construction management students from Western doing something oh, for ARF at Ingalls, and then they moved and redid whatever their project was. I don't recall what their project even was. So, so, so there's and, the, what's being built here is what's been requested. Okay. Okay. So, a couple things are in mind. We've got more than ARF that we're working with that's true okay um so that could be one element and then if, if we're trying to bring in like a, a building with sides and a roof line and then try to do another one yeah. I, i've got a pad in this bed that's built for the type of building that's designed okay, okay. and if it's if, it, if you put anything else there then i don't know right no no, no. That, that's well, enough of an answer for me yeah, to say that's, okay, me too. that's fine I definitely believe they need storage. They serve in so many ways. And if kilns don't get taken care of, that affects the whole project schedule, basically. Is that a fair statement? Well, or for, what I'm saying, it's a, if the kilns don't get taken care of, you will not, we will not have any recovery of the kiln. It doesn't affect project because the contractor is going to go in and knock it down and put it in a lamp or yeah. C and D lamp. If we're trying to recover something out of it, it has to be done within the next couple of months. So if the radiant flooring comes out, you need to get another two hundred and twenty four thousand dollars or so. Yeah. Three thirty eight minus one fourteen. Yeah. Well, I'm personally, uh, what Commissioner Rao just said, I, I feel like to eliminate the rate of floor, but I think the other pieces for our long range plans and goals, those are important. Uh, Don, if I could just add, uh, circling back to the question about how long these prices can be held, the bid uh, guarantee, the bid security that was requested is for 60 days. So if you were to award the base bid now and start to make way in the contract that you do have some time to make decisions on the alternates without worry of those prices changing. But my, my request for this board would be no later than November. Yes. And again, it, it, it prohibits the contractor from really being able to start and to schedule and sequence the work without knowing the full scope. Commissioner Luker, do you have any thoughts? Oh, I've got plenty of thoughts, Mr. Chairman, but I just kind of waiting to hear everybody else. <laughs> uh, I, you know, I guess my thing first and foremost is I agree with you. I've never had any luck out of radiant floors. I mean, we've installed them in many different things and always they've been a problem and the longevity of them um, has never been good. So, um, that that's my only heartburn as far as with uh, um, all the um, additional things there. So um, you know, um, out of the three hundred and thirty-eight thousand, uh, you know, we talk about taking out the radiant floors, and um, I say that you know, minus that, in compared to five point three million, it kind of seems like we're. Uh, tripping over dimes to save a nickel 
uh, on a project. I mean, the 5.3 is the biggest number. And, you know, if we're going to spend that and we're going, um, you know, we're going definitely um, um, Cadillac style in this, then, you know, you might as well um, add those additional uh, elements in there. Minus, in my opinion, the radiant heat. I want to um, ask a question about the floor, and I want to go back to what Commissioner Deed said about the epoxy floor versus the polished floor. What is the polished floor made of? Well, it's it's just a polished concrete. So it would be the building slab, uh, then ground and polished to um, it, it's a higher sheen. It's a smoother surface. It just becomes easier to clean and. And that's why I say, as far as the floor goes, it's it the epoxy or the polished floor would be really equally easy to clean and equally chemical resistant and so forth. Did, it's did really they, where the, I'm sorry. I was just going to ask. Excuse me. Did they put a coating or some kind of sealer on the concrete? It will be a sealed concrete as part of the base bid. Yes. The big thing is, Mr. Chairman, is uh, I'm a big fan of epoxy. Um, in the fact of how it seals off your seams, basically, you know, from the floor to the walls. If you have, you know, you have a dog peeing on it or whatever, and it gets up under there, then you you have um, more potential for, you know, viruses, uh, bacteria, everything that can grow up under there and with that and from it. Um, whereas if you seal it with that epoxy, then you don't um, have that as much. So, you know, that's the reason I, I mean, personally, I'm a fan of it. That That's exactly right. Uh, and I would add to that, that the epoxy floor um, and the one specifically that we, that we specify with Sharon Williams is, is meant for this application. So it is highly chemical resistant to all of the cleaning chemicals that are used or the chemical, you know, as, as, the, as they uh, sanitize the, the building over time. So you wouldn't, it would be very difficult to get that same level of, um, of, you know, removal of bacteria if you have those gaps and those seams, because, you know, you would never be able to reach them to fully clean them and sanitize. Uh, go, going back to what Commissioner Deed said about having, he, he has personal experience, and I think we can all attest that we've probably seen what he's talking about where, you do have, and you yourself said that you've seen um, epoxy floor that has deficiencies in it and, and most likely they resulted from an application, a bad application, not necessarily the product, but may have just been done the wrong way. Uh, whatever happened, happened. But do we have some kind of warranty with this? I mean, I know you're, you're speaking very highly of this product, the Sherman Williams brand product uh, does it come with some kind of warranty if three years down the road all of a sudden we see the kind of problems that have been mentioned here? Uh, yes, our specification includes a warranty and it also outlines the conditions for installation. So for instance, um, you know, one of the things that we require is a moisture test on the slab to make sure that the slab is poured, has cured properly to receive the flooring. I mean, so there, you know, it's a whole um, a sequence of things that has to happen in order for that to, um, for that product to be properly installed. And so our specification outlines all of that in the level of quality to be expected and then it, it does include a, a warranty. Uh, and when we go through the shop drawing process, uh, we'll receive all of that information from the contractor and, and I'll be sure to, rec to review that closely with Don to make sure that we're, everybody remains comfortable with that and, and exactly how it plays out once that subcontractor's on board. Mr. Chairman, I'll say on that, the biggest issues we've always found with it where um, uh, Commissioner Dietz was mentioning that was that they didn't get the uh, ratio of uh, resin and epoxy um, mixed correctly um, and or they um, didn't come back and go with the sealer over top of it. And uh, the ones that, uh, you know, that we've tested and um, 
got the samples back on and everything's been correct, you know, they've been, um, they've been amazing. So, um, you know, that's, that's where we've seen the issues come from in those in the past. But uh, I will say the Sherman Williams product is definitely the best one on the market out there right now. For that. <laughs> He's just repeating what the architects so are talking about. <laughs> Mr. Dietz, I, I, any, any other comments or thoughts? What's your thoughts about the all other offerings? I know you. I agree with Mr. Luke. When you start handling and battling, with one side of this or the other, or one line or the other, and then you compare it to the full cost, you wonder why you wasted your time. Because are you talking about five million three hundred thousand, or are you talking about five million three hundred and forty six thousand or whatever? So I Mr. Looker, I agree completely with you on that. I think one of the things still too, we're going to move the recycling center, aren't we? How much do we, so that's really a cost into this, is it not? It will be a cost, yes. And how much are, are we kind of thinking that's going to be? I don't. Until I have a location secured, I don't have it. Well, let's say we move it at 441. How much are we thinking about maybe? I, I don't know. A million, a half million, a hundred thousand dollars. Well, it's not a hundred thousand dollars. I know that. Um, so, I wish. <laughs> we're talking about this, whatever the cost we have here. We're still talking about that cost, too, on top of that to provide this. Yes, sir. I just can't help myself. When I ran this office, I've stated here before that it was someone put a thing in the paper and said, Boy, he's going to the U.S. and he wants to take care of $50 million as a commissioner. What does he know about taking care of $50 million? Well, I agree with what he said because I had to take care of $50 million. But you start trying to pull something out of this or pull it out of there. Uh, and you get it's hard to make a difference in $5.7 million. So I, I'm, I'm against this. And I look at to put a phone system of security, it's going to cost $146,000. To put a building up, you're going to, it's going to cost $26,000, a metal building like we sit down the road here. They don't cost that. So is, is the consensus that I'm hearing, at least we're ready to move forward maybe next week? Do we need additional time? To, or are we okay to go ahead and approve the bid and the offense next week? Yeah. Commissioner Luker, I can't see you. Everybody else is shaking heads. Yes, sir. Okay. All right. Well, we'll go ahead and put it on the agenda for the next. So, just to summarize, moving forward with the bids with the kilns and alternate. Everything except the radiant pool. Everything except the radiant pool. I see. Seems to be what the consensus I've heard. And that would be $224,326 added to to our current budget. Correct. Right. Okay. Okay. All right, let's take about a five minute recess. Carrie, have yes. a good vacation. All right, thank you, Don. We're, we're going to take a recess. I'll talk Sorry. to you next week. All right, you thank you. Yeah, sure. Okay. sure enough, you're really short. I got to get out of here. Uh, all right, we'll go here. Let's do yours, right? Mine don't take very long. Okay. I just really want to. Uh, 
So, yeah, we talked about the uh, last week and then again really quickly this morning or this afternoon, uh, the first step of the soil and road to control standards and ordinances. Um, the uh, commissioners have asked us to, to look at litany of different issues and what we want to do before we go to the planning board is describe to you kind of what our, where our next step is in this discussion, which is uh, to bring back, to discuss, I mean, this is a new discussion, but one we haven't had in a couple years, um, all multifamily projects outside zoned areas don't have any design standards whatsoever. It's a subdivision ordinance, which has very minimum standards. This is what you saw happen at Millennial. Uh, what we want to do is, um, using some of our base uh, information that we do have in, in zone districts, talking about concepts of parking requirements, uh, some buffering, stormwater requirements for these types of developments, um, to begin to put together a, a regulations that would handle that type of development outside the zoned areas. And where that becomes important is if you uh, think about where we have water and sewer service, um, while some of it is located in areas that have zone jurisdictions between the municipalities and our zoned areas, um, if you go just outside of those zoned areas, there's a lot of area and property that is not included that has water and sewer service where you might see multifamily developments occur um, and have the potential to occur. And so we'd like to talk um, to you know, touch base with commissioners first before we go to the planning board and start working on this that this is something you'd like for us to continue to work on with the planning board and bring back um, some proposals on how we can uh, approach that type of development outside of our regulated districts in the county so I just want to make sure we have any comments or thoughts from them would not affect density the number of units that's already dealt with in our Mountain Hillside Zone ordinance we're just talking about the how do you build it to be then build it in a responsible manner uh, any questions from the board? I'd be happy to try to answer those and incorporate those. Any questions? I assume if we have questions, we can get them to you. Absolutely. This is the working process. I just want to touch base with commissioners before we went to the planning board and started working on that. Thank you. Guys. Very good. Thank you. So, Thank you. Let's think about five minute recess, right? I want to get up on it. Oh, I saw that email. I just took it.
this past weekend and I had to be 40 pounds heavier. <laughs> it's like, oh my gosh. <laughs> Okay, we'll come back to order, and I believe we're down to six. Yes, sir. Okay. So uh, we do have Tracy Fitzmorris here and Mr. Chad Parker here. Um, but before we... Congratulations. We're done. <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm here at your pleasure. So uh, we both manage classrooms before you should know. You can just speak up and say, be quiet. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> I'm the teachers of the word. <laughs> I'm sorry. So we do have Ms. Fitzmorris and Mr. Parker here uh, in regards to holiday direct decorations, but before they proceed forward, uh, what I wanted to do is just go summarize a little bit of what we thought the group and committee's directive was um, in regards to, uh, if you recall, for the last couple of years, there has been requests from the library, uh, from individuals and so forth, that potentially look at changing our holiday decorations to include things such as a menorah and canora and things of that nature. Um, it was decided that that needed to be thought into these presentations or thought into how the decorations would be put up. And so ultimately, um, the task to the committee was to try to figure out within the law how to come up with ideas or concepts of how this would be integrated into the current holiday decoration scheme. Now, what I've done is I've handed out to you a legal opinion from the county attorney in regards to these issues. And their legal opinion does talk about, um, and again, I'm going to summarize it and he Heather and I butcher it, you jump in and, and correct me. But in essence, um, ultimately, when you're dealing with things like the menorah and when you're dealing with things like a nativity scene, they are considered non-secular or religious items. And there are certain things that you, criteria that you have to follow in order to meet constitutional law. And so these are ideas and concepts that the committee was trying to take into consideration when they thought of the idea of what they're being asked, because we understand that the original request was a menorah, but the menorah is also considered a religious, uh, a non-secular item. And so ultimately as a committee, uh, we we're trying to anticipate what the future conversations were going to be. And so that's why you see enclosed in the packets ideas and concepts that include a menorah, a canora, a nativity scene, also pictures in regards to how it would fit within the fit within the the holiday decoration scheme itself. So I just want to summarize why we are where we're at. You've got a legal opinion in front of you. Um, ultimately, whenever you do start going down the road of putting religious icons or items onto public property, you will open yourself to discussions um, and open yourself to request uh, questions, criticism, whatever you want to call it. Um, and so, the t again, I'm reiterating, and I want to throw this conversation out before we get into presentations. I'm reiterating that the goal and task of the the committee was to basically try to put these items in the decorations that would fit within constitutional law. I mean, and so that was what we were attempting to do. So, uh, can you? I, I just, I'll, I'll just personally say, <clears throat> and I, I appreciate the context of what's been said. I appreciate the work that the committee did. I know that this has, uh, the issue of the menorah has come up a couple of different times and it's usually come up right at the time the decorations are being installed. And that's why our manager asked that we try to deal with this um, in a time of the year that is not the holiday season, not the time when decorations are being put up, but it puts our employees in a bad position where uh, some they're putting up one set of decorations and it's been requested that we substitute or alternate or add to or whatever the case may be. 
other other items. I, for one, personally do not believe that we should put up religious symbols on county government property uh, on this hillside during this holiday season with these other decorations. And I understand that that the what decorations that we do put up, they are referred to commonly as Christmas trees. But a Christmas tree is a, is a name that is given to a decoration that has been widely accepted as a secular, a secular holiday decoration that bears no religious tone to it. It does not, it's not in any way connected to any kind of religion, um, whereas a menorah, a canora, or a manger or nativity scene, they do. A canora is a cultural thing. Cultural, it's yes, it's a cultural. So, personally, I am a very dedicated, devout Christian, uh, and I have multiple manger scenes in my home that we place out as a holiday decoration in my home. But as a individual property owner, I have the right to do that because that's what we celebrate that holiday. Uh, I attend a religious uh, institution. I'm a member of a church. Uh, we put up manger scenes. I've been a part of a live manger nativity scene. We frequently visit those around the community during the holiday season uh, because that's what I enjoy. At the same time, um, our son, uh, we celebrated Hanukkah. We have some very good Jewish friends. We celebrated Hanukkah. We made a menorah and, and helped them celebrate. And it's another holiday and it was something done, but it was done through a personal uh, effort outside the realm of government. Uh, I just think personally, we create a real problem when we start putting religious symbols on government property. Uh, right now, we have a beautiful decoration. It's not controversial. It's just holiday trees, Christmas trees with lights. I think everybody seems to enjoy it, and I just don't feel like it's something we ought to do. That's just my personal opinion, and I, I'm willing to put that out there. Now, I appreciate the effort, the, the questions, the committee's work, but I just don't feel like we need it. That's, I just want to say that point like up front. So, I mean, if we want to see the presentation and go through the presentation about the, the decorations and then make a decision where we can do that at this time. Okay. Um, well, then I'll turn it over to uh, Trey. Are you there, Ms. Fitzmorris? I'm here. Okay. So, um, what I'll do is um, I'll go ahead and put the information up on the screen. And um, I'll just I have Chad here standing here too, Chad Parker. And um, Tracy, do you want to take the lead in this conversation? Sure, I can. I will say that um, in people do come to the library wondering where other displays are. I know holiday trees are not a Christian symbol, but the whole idea of the decoration is for Christmas and they feel I have employees and I have residents of the town that have every year ask why they are not represented. So I'm just putting that out there as far as the representation goes. Um, we did, we did study a lot about um, different areas that had arranged uh, different decorations on their, in front of their courthouses or their government property. Um, the Canara is a cultural icon, not a religious symbol. Um, the menorah is a religious, although it has been accepted as secular in some towns, uh, depending on how it is lit, whether it's lit during an actual Hanukkah um, but we agreed that, you know, it is a religious symbol to 
uh, as far as the law goes here. Um, those were the only two that had been requested, but we did believe that if a uh, menorah was put up, it was likely, like 100% likely, that a nativity scene would also um, be requested, which is why um, we ended up choosing uh, three very similar displays. They're all roughly the same height, the same manufacturer. Um, they would blend in nicely with all of the other decorations. Um, we looked at many different locations um, to try and blend them in because if they're blended into a holiday decoration and not just set aside in one like religious corner, they are totally acceptable uh, as far as a legal standpoint goes. Um, so I'm not sure We've had three or four meetings and everyone seemed pleased with the results, including um, one of my staff members who feels strongly um, about this issue. Um, but if you have questions, I'll be glad to let you know what I can answer. So Tracy, I'll jump in here a little bit and ask Chad to talk about the design your discussions about the height and uh, one of the points was even though we're all if this is being offered up as a design don't get set exactly where these locations are because the guys when they put this up they what well, you said you tell them yeah but I, mean, well, I know what you're getting at Mandy Cage and Ira Jones have worked on this for, for many years and done a great job with it um, one of the things that they requested in this process was to be able to uh, have the liberty to be able to move some things around a little bit. Uh, it's just the way you see them there may not be exactly where they would go if it's decided that we go that route. Um, but as far as size of the different items, um, they're pretty much the same size. I mean, as far as height, um, I think you know, I think I'm saying that right, Tracy. But um, we uh, and we all did agree on the committee that uh, to go with these type of symbols as far as the height. It's there, not, not the symbol itself, but the, the lighted symbol, um, rather than something that's not, so that it would work better maybe with the lights and things. So uh, yeah, we, uh, we we would like, if, if we do move forward with it, have the liberty to be able to move those maybe in different areas if need be. But I will say that we were all in agreement, kind of in the general area that you see on this paper, that we're all in general. So we're all in agreement with that general area of the item. Nice to get snowed like that all the time. Well, you know, the snow will always be there, but yeah. You, 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 you and your staff can't arrange that. So. <laughs> <laughs> Not naturally. Yeah. <laughs> but if I'm like Tracy, if you have any questions or anything, you let me answer. So the recommendation of the committee was it's in it's incandescent lights okay so this is the recommendation this is okay mr chairman yes sir go ahead what, what was uh our attorney's opinion on this again yes and and uh commissioner Luther, i just um emailed forwarded an email to you with that attached so you, so you may have it that way um, but based this, the, the Supreme Court does a case by case analysis, so I cannot say yes or no, this would be accepted. However, it is, it is my opinion that this meets the majority of the tests that were put forth in those two U.S. Supreme Court cases. It does leave some question because it is a, in a prominent place in the community. It is in, at an old entrance to or a, a well known entrance to a public building. Um, but ultimately, I think this would be okay under the U.S. Supreme Court analysis, but again, it's a case-by-case -case basis. I did raise the issue that it will generate complaints. 
Um, this is probably nativity scenes create the biggest uh, form of complaints for local governments in this manner during that time of year. Um, when, when I was hired, I was asked to keep us out of lawsuits. Uh, that, that is a, a understatement of my uh, opinion there in that the way we've done it in the past with what this US Supreme Court deems secular items would keep us out of lawsuits. This leaves some questions. Well, I mean, I appreciate and I appreciate your honesty. And, you know, uh, with that, I mean, I would be under the uh, same um, idea as uh, our chairman. Yeah. Why, I mean, why open ourselves up for more scrutiny than what we're already at, but then put us in the chance of that liability? Most complaints have occurred and there's been lawsuits. Does that mean when the public entity has only selected one religious symbol to put up? Uh, most of the ones that, I mean, we don't, we don't know all of them because they're not opinions that, that come out from sometimes from the lower courts, when the lower courts interpret these. Um, but generally when what I've, the research I, and, and discovery I did found that when there's a nativity scene involved, it starts that that issue. They don't all end in lawsuits. Um, but yes, I mean, ultimately, some of those factors are is the is the religious object over by itself. Um, but but other factors are is it in an entryway? Is it in a prominent location of a of a government building? And again, this is now a library. It's not courthouse. So that's why I added in my opinion there that I think that that helps with regard to the U.S. Supreme Court analysis is that this is not in front of a, a, a courthouse building used for county operations or for court procedures. So all of those things, there are several factors that, that they look at. So, and again, when you talk about the recommendation of the committee, we're, we're recommending because it started off with manure, but once it was understood that manure is a religious item, mm -hmm. then it, it it makes this a more complicated conversation than just holiday decorations. And so, um, you know, there's a nativity scene here, but there may be other requests or other conversations. Once you go down this line, you just need to be prepared that if you do allow for a religious item to be put there, then there will be feedback, whether it be the menorah or the nativity scene, or because it's considered non secular. Well, there's feedback now. That's, that's what started the conversation, yeah. right? I mean, if you're asking for legal, what's the safest route legally? The, the safest route legally is to, is to do what we have been doing, can keep it as secular items that, again, these are items that are determined by the U.S. Supreme Court as secular. Every, you know, everybody, they have their opinion, but that's our legal definition. When you start adding religious items, that that's when you get some of that, that risk and liability. Even though I've my opinion is that the way the committee has designed this probably meets those standards. That's just, that's an opinion. And it is determined on a case by case basis. Any other thoughts or comments? I have a question for Ms. Baker. I just meant, so this would meet the standard. However, 
it does what we would assume more risk if we put anything religious on up there. Is that a fair summary to get just to the bare bones? And I know, I know, shouldn't probably ever ask an attorney to do that. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. No, it, it, it would probably meet. Good. And, and that, that's where I put the answer there because it is subjective, it is case by case. It's my opinion that it probably does meet that analysis. So, yes, other than. Any other comments or questions? Well, obviously, we don't take action today. This is just a work session. Okay. Thank you, Chris. Thank you. Yeah, thank you to the committee and to Chad for their hard work and Heather. Thank you so much. Thank you. Next time. Uh, yes, what I'm bringing before the board, um, and if it's okay with board, I'm going to stay right here. I can see the screen better right here. Um, I, I'm bringing the first item of discussion is, if you recall, due to the, uh, the spill, oil spill that we had at the uh, Community Services Center project, the health department, that we we're going to have some, some deed restrictions necessary to put onto the property. Well, when I first had this conversation with the board, it was thought that the restrictions would be directly related to restricting residential uses, but commercial uses would be allowed. Well, since then, um, I tried to include the different language that's been provided to me. It, the state has come back and they've chosen a little bit different language, and I believe it to actually be better language. So a couple of things that you have included is first is I wanted to include the actual letter that's written to me. Uh, the key key thing on this letter, it says, be advised that although soil contamination at the site exceeds unrestricted use standards for a low priority site, it's possible to receive a final no further action determination. So that's what we're uh, attempting to achieve is a no further action determination. Uh, but I also wanna, it was kind of interesting when I received this letter, um, it basically uh, states here, let me find the actual language. Therefore, the incident is ranked as low priority in accordance with North Carolina statute. You are not directed to proceed with additional assessment or corrective action. So I, I just, I, I point out this language because the state sees this all as somewhat of a low priority for them. Um, and so what has somewhat changed when you go through and look at the language itself, oh wow. Um, they have a deed book and page. Okay. So the language itself that they're proposing to go on the deed is soil uh, containing residual petroleum contamination of, above the applicable standards exist on the site in the area of soil contamination. So you can see it as quotation marks. We'll talk about that here in a second. Um, shown on the attached aerial photograph, uh, no soil from a depth of three feet or more shall be excavated or otherwise disturbed in this area, except as to remediate it in accordance with all applicable state and federal law. So they're saying in that particular area, you can't dig more than three feet unless you clean it up, which would have been what we would have done if we were in there. But you recall, we chose not to do it because we did not want to get close to the footers at the time. So when you go through and look at the, the actual attachment here, the area of remaining soil contamination is actually the purple. So it's not this square, and it's not even that little square, it's the purple right next to the corner of that building right there. So in essence, the rest of this site is unrestricted. Complete. Okay, so in essence, what they're saying is, is if we want to dig more than three feet right there, um, say if we want to expand the building out right there, then we would need to clean it up in accordance to the standard. I mean, we'd have to go in there and test it, make sure it gets cleaned out. Well, if we're ever going to expand the building right there, we're going to be dealing with potential footage, things of that nature. So uh, at this point, um, 
even though they, it surprised me, they changed the language a little bit. But when I read all the email correspondence from the state and, and just information I've received from NEO, they're all considering this a lesser restriction. Now, I think Heather, you had mentioned um, there may be some value of surveying this. Or? Yeah, what I was saying is, you know, if you touch this aerial um, and, and it's recorded, it, it's hard to determine it, it, exactly that location or would be in the future if, if you wanted to really be certain and, and pinpoint it to, you know, go ahead and invest a little bit of money into surveying that area out and then patching a, a, a survey description of the area that's restricted so there's no question in the future. And so we can explore that conversation. I'll, I'll ask the I'll ask the group though. I do believe it just occurred to me that they will they will make us dig until it's negative. So we can have a survey. But my point is, is when we dig it out, we will keep testing until the tests come up negative. And so that may be within that purple or it could be larger. So other than that, I, I feel pretty comfortable moving forward with this, this requirement, actually. So will it require us to approve anything? Yeah, I, you know, ultimately we're talking about putting a deed restriction on the property. So I do believe it would require a vote at the board. Okay. Is everybody okay with that? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Okay. All right. So do, you, do we want to do the survey? What, what I'll do is I'll explore it more. I'll reach out and get the regulations on. And if, it, if there's value, then we'll we'll proceed forward with the survey of the Secretary of the Board. If, if, I'll just rely on the state to tell us what they will recommend. Okay. Next item of discussion um, is the Appalachian Women's Museum. And uh, this is in regards to the pump station that's been previously discussed. and. What you have enclosed in your packets is a letter from Lofquist and Associates. And Lofquist and Associates basically has now, I think, put together a quote or an estimate of what is needed to actually take care of this situation. This, this is now putting, putting us in a position or putting the board in a position to make decisions and in order to figure out how much money needs to be raised. And so if you look at Lofquist's quote, you can see that he, he's put an estimate in for the pump station of 14.8. Um, he's also put in an estimate for the excavation and equipment installation. He's put in an estimates for just materials, uh, estimates for trenching and piping, uh, estimates for these other areas. Uh, under the engineering side, he did permitting fees for TWASA. Engineering design is $3,000. He also put in some costs for assisting uh, the owner to solicit a couple bids of about $1,100. And then he put in an estimate for uh, him as an engineer going out three or four visits during the installation. Uh, ultimately, I think, Commissioner Woody, you and I was talking about that, that the Appalachian Women's Museum just may need that little bit of assistance when they're installing a system out there. I'm talking about from the engineer. So if you look, um, if you look, that would be the other project cost of six thousand dollars. So there is, this is probably higher than what a lot of people anticipating, but there is an estimate put on this project cost of thirty-four thousand seven hundred sixty dollars. Will this hook up their water as well? Didn't say anything about that. Well, and. And I do want to give um, Mr. Lockwood's credit. He did this estimated rate. He did not charge that. And, and oftentimes they do, which was a nice um, offer to our community. Um, I, it concerns me, though, that I mean, I guess we all know that you, you have to have this, but it seems like it's up to Twasa. You know, it's not like a septic tank. And <laughs> well, I, I think whoever you, whether it be, whether it be um, Lockwood or another engineer, oh, I, know. No, um, no, no, no. I believe the other engineering estimate for just the design was $10,000. Yeah. 
Right. You remember, I think it was ninety one hundred dollars so. or something like that, just yeah. for the design, yeah. just for the three thousand. And I don't think right. that person was coming out on site and visiting and all of that. So he's giving us a deal. So you know, I'm sure what would happen. The cost will end up once you bid it, then the cost are going to be the cost, right? If that's where he's talking about assisting them to go out and solicit quotes, and this is an estimate. But um, this is what was really this is this is what's needed for this board to make a decision. Now, if another engineer could come in and do an estimate and be lower, then then so pay. be it. But this is the kind of detail that the Women's Museum and the town and the town of Dillsborough and the county needs to understand what it will take. Yeah, with Watson's new hard new budget and fee schedule. Not sure why this wouldn't be one of them that went to zero. I was hoping we could get a deal. We might not even have to get a deal. I think yeah. this might be a oh, I see. where we reduce it. Because them, it's a non Because we reduced them over a two year period. Okay. Because of COVID, you know, and, yes. and different issues. Oh, I, sure. I have to go back and verify, but I'm not sure, you know, what happened in the time period in COVID. So, and yeah. there's obviously the opportunity as a nonprofit to talk to the Boston Board to it and say, hey, yeah. now, give us a one thing that Daniel Manring <clears throat> mentioned that he was going to use a grant to help with this, and I don't see that subtracted I from here. So I'm hoping that that will lessen the actual cost to that. Well, well, let me ask. We're talking about all this. Is this something that the women? So now there's numbers right in yes. front of us. Yeah. So is this something that the women's museum could go back to Twat and see if they can figure out how to knock this? I mean. I'm trying to figure out what the next steps No, I, I think um, Mr. Mamrick already said that they he was going to use the grant. I, I know that. There's there is money in the Twasa budget for community for grants. grants. So it gets called so much said, year and stuff. So there's some yes. money there. And Mr. Lawquist is just giving an estimate on what it would be without it. Yes. That's so right. I think hopefully that would help. And then we'll get Commissioner needs to do the trenching number four with his equipment. <laughs> He's got that big equipment. Is, is everyone comfortable with the estimates just to move forward? Yes. And then, do you mind if I contact Kathy? Um, and make sure that that grant was still the possibility that she had mentioned. What grant are you talking about? From Twasa. And have her contact Daniel and I'll talk to him as well. Okay. Okay. You well, how don't you, you talk? You're, you're on the board. Yeah. You go ahead. So is the thing about it is, though, a lot of this is, is equipment and a pumping station. There's no, we can't help with that. Although, I don't know if the grant might help. Well, it is what it is. So. I know. Yeah. Mr. Adams, okay. So, the grant that we're talking about from TWASA, is that just for the fees or is that to help for installation and all of that? I, Generally, it has been like the Kobe Fire Department. We end up, all their connection fees and everything just sit, you don't even pay anything. Well, they might have to still pay their tax. The, at that time, we were under the old, so they had like $20,000 worth of system development fees. And at this time, they're called something different. Um, and we said you don't have to pay. I think there's been other times where we've worked. I, I mean, like the community table, we've done a bunch of work down there. Twasa has recently and mm -hmm. donated some labor, excavating some things, and getting some stuff installed. So there's been some ways we've come up to work with folks. Well, when I, I'm using we speaking for Twasa right now, that yes. we've done some things like that for organizations like this. So I guess the thing to do is now that we have numbers is have Kathy talk to Daniel. I'll, I'm taking a picture right now. So okay. Text of it and say, hey, here's something else we need to start. And he's already been involved in these conversations. Right? Yes. So, yes. Hey, what, what, what can Twasa do yes. to help with this? And we'll start working on that. And, and I think it goes back to the fact that, Commissioner Woody, you, you said and you stated you requested they need this. They Even if we had to pay 100% of what's on the screen, we've got to have it. So, have and they don't have water to the sink in the kitchen, right? because they're waiting 
you know, Russell was waiting, which I understand for a hookup. So are there other costs associated? Is that going to be another? I, I would assume it's part of it. I mean, it's already to that building. The so, water line. So really just the next steps is needed from the county side is, yes. is, is what is the amount of money being asked of the county? And next, so for example, if this was it, then the request before the board would be that you're willing to fund up to $34,760 to go towards this project. And then that puts the finances in place to do that. So you can either approach it in that manner or you have these other questions, these other questions of twice and so forth, and then find out are there other monies available? And then let's just say Twasa can do a, I don't know, a five thousand dollar grant. Okay, then the request to the board would be to fund up to twenty nine thousand seven hundred sixty dollars of this. So that's really where we're at now. Oh. It's just trying to determine the amount of this estimate, what the commissioners would fund up to. Is that correct? Correct. Okay. And well, and I think the good thing about this, there won't be hidden costs here because we know what's. I mean, hopefully he's put in enough cushion in there that it's going to cover the actual cost. Yeah. That's what we're asking him to do. Okay. So does the board, do you think by Tuesday we would know the answers? Oh, that's all right. Did you think? Number six. That's the path, wouldn't it be? Right there. What? What path? Connection. Connection. Exists yeah. in the main course. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Always. This is purely sewer. Yeah. That's all that we've been talking about. Because she told me it's they were waiting for it to be turned on by the faucet. They already hooked it up. That was water, water right? Water. Yeah, yes, I heard that. I don't thought that had happened a long time ago. Yeah. But they didn't have a sewer, so they. So they waiting to where would that water? If they turned the water on in the sink, where would it go? Uh oh, there's no seat, so they couldn't turn it on. It, it totally makes sense, yeah. even though it was already there. <laughs> it, I know it went in the creek for years. <laughs> it did, but we know that. So, okay, okay. Well, we're all well, do, we, do we know? Do you think by Tuesday we would have an idea of what Twasa could do? Do we what want to put this on Tuesday's right? agenda? Yes. Maybe. And I, an idea, yes, but it would have to be go to the. I mean, we're having a work session tonight, so I think this will be on the agenda for tonight. Could uh, you just ask him? Well, I just said, I've already sent him an email. I mean, he's got screen, he's got photos of these two documents now. Okay. I just sent it to him. So okay. I'm doing what I can to speed it up. I, I don't know. Thank you. Uh, so, y'all tell me what you want to do. I want to approve it and be done with it. Yes. <laughs> okay. All right. So, put it on Tuesday. It's going to be paid for, basically. Okay. Yeah. Because the request of the vote would be you would fund up to 34,760 towards this project. Or any damn lower thing. <laughs> <laughs> right. Mr. Luker, any concerns? No, sir. Mr. Chairman, I'm in agreement with you. Let's approve it and move on. All right, we're ready. Great. Um, next item is the NCACC goals. And um, this is the original language that was presented to the board. And Commissioner Mao, I believe you had sent me at the noon or something, right? New yeah. language. And then uh, um, I've got the new language somewhere here. Um, and I can give everybody copies of it. Do you want to? And I emailed it to everybody. Yeah. I mean, you all got BCC, but I know that's not always the easiest way to pull it up over the computer. And I've had some thoughts. I've had some thoughts about that. I'm just wondering if we should present this period right now as a goal. I mean, I know it's something that has been talked. I've. I had this conversation last spring during my unsuccessful campaign for state with some current state yeah. legislatures that they know it's an issue. Okay. Um, 
Now, what that means that it happens, yeah. I don't know. Yeah, I, don't know. yeah, I mean, and the, the committee's working on it. The committee right. that's working on it. I just from an association, how how the association would come down on it as I don't know that it maybe is a goal oriented issue. Maybe we should just hold on on it and let the committee just play out. Take no action on it. Express our opinion. Yeah. See, don't the committee is your committee thinking about both these items? That's true. That's a good Unless somebody just has a burning desire to have something to vote on it today. Right. Let's move on. <laughs> Don't worry about it. It's on your seven. I'm making copies. I'm going to have to put them in your box. Uh, so, uh, all right. So then the uh, next item discussion is the release of financial forensic investigation report for the Glenville Cashers Rescue Squad. Uh, what is included on this attachment are two items. Uh, one is attachment 7D1, which is a cover letter. And then 7D2 is the actual report itself. Um, and basically, if the board will bear with me, I just want to go over the summary letter real quick and then uh, not really going to comment on the report itself because it basically speaks for itself. Um, as you can see, what I've attempted to do on this release is give a little bit of history here. And, uh, and I know, if you bear with me, I know you as board members know this through other means, but this is more for the public than anything else, is, uh, is that in late 2018, leadership from the Glenville Cashers Rescue Squad informed Jackson County of concerns to potentially inappropriate transactions that had taken place within their organization. Once it was understood that potential criminal accusations could be made, both the county and squad leadership requested the law enforcement investigate the issue. Um, the county currently has an annual cost for squad services, we have a contract with them for $116,421 a year, and we have a contract with them to provide EMS services at $1,093,257 a year. Since there was a significant financial relationship between the county and the squad, the county decided that it was a, a good next step to hire an independent forensic auditor to investigate. Uh, we engaged Dixon Hughes Goodman to perform the investigative services in May of 2019. This investigation took place with the full cooperation of the squad's leadership. The forensic investigation covered the years 2016, 2017, and 2018. The report was completed November 20, 2019 and distributed as needed to investigative purposes. The final report is attached, which was that link I just mentioned to this letter. And just letting everybody know the information is redacted of items such as bank account numbers and so forth. Um, there have been potential issues uh, identified with financial transactions that have taken place between the Glenville Cashers Rescue Squad and Sullivan Custom Homes. These issues are being adjudicated through the court system and licensing board. The report concludes that no other items of concern were identified other than the issues associated with Sullivan Custom Homes. The report also states that all other transactions reviewed appeared appropriate and reasonable. And just want to finalize this with saying it's unfortunate these issues have taken place with Glenville Cashers Rescue Squad. The incidents appear to be isolated and steps have been taken to protect taxpayer dollars and EMS rescue services to the area. The squad's leadership states that they have appropriate procedures in place to manage and monitor all aspects of their business and financial transaction. This includes multi-layered management oversight and strict internal control procedures, checks and balances processes, and strong conflicts of interest policies. Squad leadership states that their 1819 financial audit conducted by an independent Third party audit firm did not identify any financial issues. Uh, and just Jackson County, we look forward to continue working with the squad to provide high quality EMS service and rescue service. 
Mr. Chairman, that's my report. Yeah. Um, and we will vote to release this report at Tuesday's meeting. Is that what it's being requested? No, it's released. It's released. It's, it's, okay. it's, on, it's online. It's already. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So no action needed on this. No, sir. Okay. Thank you. Next item, we do have uh, issued uh, an item for Cashew Glenville Volunteer Fire Department. And Mr. Chief Diller, are you on? Yes, sir. Put the screen on. We want to see them. We're here. Well, he may not be smart enough to get the eye to the camera. <laughs> How would we do that? Oh, there we go. All right, we can see you now. Okay. Oh. <laughs> hey. <laughs> <laughs> you may not be able to see us, but we can see you. Oh, we see you. All right. <laughs> Welcome. Thank you. Who have you got with you there? This is Mr. Glenn Cohn. He's president of the board. Okay, yeah, he was partially on the screen, partly off, but I see him. Oh, let me get him in here. There you go. Okay, the floor is yours. Right. Mr. Dillard, uh, they do have the proposed resolutions. Uh, Ms. Winchester sent it out to them. And uh, if you want, I could go ahead and pull up on tax maps the property we'll be discussing, and you should be able to see the screen, I, I believe. But that would ahead, be great. Uh, Start your presentation. Well, as, as most of you know, we have been trying to purchase this property beside us for a good while. And we're not interested in building right away. We're just trying to secure some future for our town. And it's about the only land left that is available that would work for us. So we've been trying to get it secured. And during all this, the Boys and Girls Club bought half of it. So we have ended up trying to secure the other half and uh, we're going after a loan with United Community Bank and it looks like about a 2.36 tax exempt loan, but they've asked for a few things that's a little bit different than we're accustomed to. And one of them being this resolution from the commissioners, which has no bearing to my understanding on the commissioners other than just your support. So uh, that's what we're asking for today. And Heather Baker has been working with uh, their attorney. And Heather, I don't know if I want to add anything to the resolution. So this is requested from United Community Bank's attorney. It, this gets into the tax code is the only reason this is requested. And, and uh, we, we had a little differing of opinion of whether it's needed or not, but ultimately, it doesn't do anything other than give your support to them for approving the approving the loans. It doesn't obligate you to any financials, and it it does make the bank happy to proceed and able to proceed with the loan. So, Randy, can you see I have the property up now? I don't know. If yes, sir. All right. So this is the property that we're discussing, correct? Yes. Yes, sir. And the Boys and Girls Club have purchased this half of the property already, correct? Yeah, they recently closed on the other half. So uh, the county would need to approve this resolution prior to their being able to close. Correct, but after they hold the public hearing. After so yeah, we're, we would actually ask that this go on the November 3rd agenda because I believe they're gonna hold their public hearing on October 23rd, which is after Tuesday's meeting. And so November 3rd would be the requested date. Okay. All right. Any questions or Mr. Powell? I have one question on the language. Is municipality being used the way it should be in this document? I, 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 I hear municipality and I think of an incorporated town. They had municipality all throughout this. I thought uh -huh. I caught them all and changed them all because I changed it to county instead of municipality and mm -hmm. changed so if there's not, I see one, I see the one you're talking about here. I'll have them change that because I changed the others and they okay. accepted. accepted there, there were a change. couple I think I saw. Okay. So yeah. Okay. That's all I had. Other questions from the commissioners? Chief Dillard, I believe it's all good. Thank you. If you'll uh, come.
come up here and go meet Mr. Terry Young with the Department of Insurance with me now. That's my next meeting. We'll be great. Oh, yeah. We can do that. Yeah. Well, thank you. He was real kind to us. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I understand. And congratulations. And thank you all very much for your support in this. Yeah, Absolutely. Very much, folks. All right. Thank you both. Thank you. Right, have a good day. Take that one up and, uh, yes, sir. and on item F, the monument discussions are not prepared today. Uh, take any other. I thought we might be, but Gail and I have not had a chance to get together, and so we'll carry that one over. I know we got some other business to do. Like this. Do you have anything else, Ron, for a uh, work session topics? I do not. Gail, let, let, me, let me back up. I've already asked to try to get that on the agenda. So I'm as fast as I can. <laughs> you have anything else for work session? Mickey, anything else for work session? No, Mr. Chairman, thank you. Don, anything else for work session? Okay. So we'll adjourn the work session and then we'll call back to order the reconvening. Is that correct? Uh, uh, can correct. I just make one statement? Please. People that are listening, I was part of the monument discussion. Um, I've reached out to community members and have been working on drafts and, and Commissioner Matt Mahanis as well. So uh, I don't want the public to think that this is not front and center, but we are being very thoughtful and careful about how we proceed. Absolutely. And also we're um, um, going to have the uh, Right here in front of me. But, um, right here. Well, anyway, there's a Andrew Mellon Foundation uh, is yeah. offering some grant funds for alterations. It's, it's something that we'll follow up on to provide yeah. that feedback as well. Anyhow, uh, anything else before we adjourn? I have a motion that we adjourn the uh, work session. Move to adjourn the work session. Okay, is there a second? Second. All favor say aye. 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 Okay. Now, I will ask that we reconvene, call to order the, the meeting that originally started on October the 6th. We recessed, call back to order today, October 13th, recessed again. And so we're going to reconvene it for the third time. Uh, Mr. Adams? Yes, sir. I, I apologize, but I, I do need to request the board to go into closed session on the personnel. Okay. So we do need to go into closed session concerning personnel, GS 143-318-11A6. So I'll let staff take the opportunity to um, exclude everybody. Normally yeah, we do. So I have a motion to go into closed session. Yeah, I still move. Yeah. All right, so a motion from Commissioner Luther. Second. A second. All in favor say aye. Aye. Logan has to get a knock this out. Three of my grandsons.